أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين يبلغون رسالات الله ويخشونه ولا يخشون أحدا إلا الله وكفى بالله حسيبا الذين يبلغون رسالات الله ويخشونه ولا يخشون أحدا إلا الله وكفى بالله حسيبا الذين يبلغون رسالات الله ويخشونه ولا يخشون أحدا إلا الله وكفى بالله حسيبا وكفى بالله حسيبا ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبي وكان الله بكل شيء عليما ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبي وكان الله بكل شيء عليما يا أيها الذين آمنوا اذكروا الله ذكرا كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اذكروا الله 
أرسلناك شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا شاهدا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا وبشر المؤمنين وبشر المؤمنين بأن لهم من الله فضلا كبيرا ولا تطع الكافرين والمنافقين ودع أذاهم وتوكل على الله وتوكل على الله وكفى بالله وكيلا ولا تطع الكافرين والمنافقين ودع أذاهم وتوكل على الله وتوكل على الله وكفى بالله وكيلا صدق الله العظيم الفاتحة الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته MashaAllah, um, this is such an incredible night for the entire Bay Area, but especially the MCC community. We are honored, alhamdulillah, today to host for the first time Sheikh Abdullah Deeb and his son, Imam Ahmed Deeb, alhamdulillah, both of them, a powerhouse duo. Uh, MashaAllah, they tour the country and do what they just did. We, our hearts are moved, and subhanAllah, even upon my first meeting, and Sheikh Abdullah, um, I wish I could have recorded that moment. It's something I want to remember and cherish for the rest of my life. Subhanallah, the, 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 the flood of du'as that, that he uh, gave me, I just, I, I was, it was so powerful, so beautiful. Uh, but this is, mashallah, who they are, just people of immense barakah. And it's fitting that the institute that Sheikh Abdullah founded is called the Itqan Institute. And I urge everyone to look at this, the, we the website and learn more about it because really, truly, mashallah, it's such a beautiful, um, you know, again, itqan means perfection or excellence. And uh, you can see in the work that they both do, mashallah, tabarakallah, that they are true to that cause. So jazakumullah khairan for being here. Um, I know we're all excited. I'm excited to hear from Imam Ahmed. So I'm going to, inshallah, pass the mic to him. Actually, I'm sorry, initially we were going to just you know, have a little bit of a impromptu, in a sense, interview, because this is your first time to our community, and we are so immensely honored to have you here, Imam Ahmed. So I have two questions for you. This topic, as we know, is so polarizing in the community. You know, any time you hear about the topic of gender, whether it's in Islam or just in general, it seems to, you know, cause a buzz. So I'm really interested to know why this topic? What brought you to, you know, put together this presentation? What inspired you, mm -hmm. having served the community, mashallah, as an imam, and 
you know, mashallah, you have such a, I, I did not have time, forgive me, to look up your bio, but I know from knowing you that you do so much, mashallah, that we, we need some time to, to, uh, to list all of the things that you do. But you've been in the community, you've witnessed, you've observed in, in the sense of, uh, you know, again, your, your service as an imam and in other roles that you have. So what brought you to the point of presenting on this topic? Inshallah, I'm going to pass the mics back to you. Yes, and then now I, I now you caught me. I actually was having a moment where I was like, wait, what is the second question? The second question, <laughs> I got it. What are the challenges fa facing us? No, I'm sorry. Was, so what are, what brought you to this topic, or what inspired you to present on this topic of gender? And then what are the challenges facing us as a community around this topic, or just in general that you again um, can comment on? Just so I'm going to pass the mics over back to you. We have a live stream, mashallah, and a live stream mic requires a different setup, so you know how these technical things work. But inshallah, it's a quick process. No worries. Just hold on one second. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala. I'm very honored to be here um, in this beautiful, beautiful, cozy place. Uh, I was telling Muneers is like one of my favorite places, um, and it's it's incredible what a space can do to um, uh, uh, just change the entire vibe of even a, a conversation. Like I've, I've I've had this conversation in a different space, and already I was sensing the presentation would be different and the feedback would be different, uh, as opposed to where we are now. Both have their advantages and disadvantages, but again. Um, I'm very honored to, to, to be here, and I want to thank um, you know, our, our beloved Sheikha for organizing this with uh, our, our brother Munir, who, uh, mashallah, I wanted to get you a shirt that said uh, uh, ED with the quickest response time in Muslim American history. <laughs> that's, just, just as a hoodie. You know, I need, I need to summarize it into like a phrase that's like bumper sticker worthy, but... You know, thank you for your, your immense excellence and it's fun in organizing, which is so much harder than people realize because I've done that role as well. And it's one of the hardest and most challenging uh, uh, roles uh, uh, that, that you can have in the community. Um, with that, inshallah, again, thank you all for, for coming. Um, I, uh, the two questions, great questions, uh, mashallah. Uh, uh, the first one, what inspired me to talk about this? A uh, level, w w one part is I, I feel, I feel like there are certain conversations that we know are difficult to have, we know are necessary to have, and that are kind of pushed under the rug. And then public intellectuals rise that don't have a Muslim framework for these conversations. And then our Muslim men and women follow those public intellectuals. And then we turn around and say, why are they following them? And, and, and that is one of the things that disturbs me most, really, about, uh, uh, about this idea generally, is that um, if, if this is something, this is just a policy, not everything needs to be entertained. But if it's an essential conversation that deals with some of the most essential aspects of what it means to be a human being, and people are talking about it, and it's a need in the community, um, it's our responsibility to rise to it, right? And, and that doesn't mean it's going to be perfect, which is why like, I want to just right off the bat tell you this presentation is not going to be perfect. I don't have all the answers. Sorry, I know that's not what you want to hear. You didn't come here to hear that, but I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to sit here and say, mashallah, come here for you know, your A to Z. I have everything figured out for you, you know, uh, and you know, I, I have all the answers. That would be an absolute lie because we live in an abs completely unprecedented time with unprecedented challenges. What we can't do is ignore these things, um, uh, and, and we, have to, we have to address them. I think the second point on that first question is that this is a topic that a lot of community dysfunction and abuse um, is the result of misunderstanding. So, so when we don't have a firm grasp of this concept or of the, this topic, we, don't, we, we haven't talked about this, haven't had conversations about this, um, a misunderstanding of what it means for you to be a Muslim man or a Muslim woman is one of the most uh, unfortunate and intense pretexts for abuse, 
and, uh, 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 and, and I mean that generally, but also it, it undercuts the fundamental role of what we're meant to be for one another as men and women. We're going to address that uh, tonight, inshallah. So that's, that's one. You know, I, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of discord, fitna, a lot of things can be prevented by having this conversation and continuing to have this conversation. Um, as for your second question, which I completely forgot, which was, what are the challenges? What are the challenges? What are the challenges? Okay, so I'll, I'll answer this very quickly. I, 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 I like to say that we live in the age of the pendulum. Age of the pendulum. You know what a pendulum is, right? Swings back and forth. But see, what's really important about this analogy is that the harder you pull the pendulum to one side, what happens? When it swings back the other side, it swings back harder, right? And it's, it becomes easy, harder to balance out, and it takes more time to get back in the middle, right? This is how I feel. Uh, uh, it, what I feel is the primary challenge to this and many other conversations. We don't have them. And so when we do, we wait for things to combust, implode. And when we do, it becomes a pendulum swinging on both ways. So one extreme comes out of nowhere because we're not having this conversation. And then that breeds another extreme because the pendulum is swinging so intensely. When, if we just, you know, tap the pendulum a little bit. You know those old clocks? You know what I'm talking about. If you've been to these, you know, museums or old homes or what have you. These old clocks, a little pendulum, and it swings back and forth. You know, if we just tap it by saying, oh, subhanAllah, this is on people's minds. Uh, let's talk about it. What, what's on your mind? What's on your heart? And, and the best way to actually have this, which we're not going to simulate tonight, um, mainly, primarily due to time um, and, and other reasons, is, is to actually have groups, micro groups, where we're doing, we're simulating a discussion so that all of us get a chance, get the, get the healing opportunity to express how we feel about this, this particular topic. Um, so, you know, th that, that's how I would answer those. I think this is a, an, an enormous uh, uh, project that I am so underqualified for. Um, I'm here, hopefully, to simply push the envelope, tap the little pendulum in hopefully a positive way that allows us to take this a little more seriously because it's at the forefront of everyone. It is so pervasive that this is one of the few topics that literally touches upon every single demographic in every age. Every age is impacted by this. Um, so I don't know if that was satisfactory. Would you like the mic back? Should we go? <laughs> All right, inshallah. So we're going to start with the presentation. Do you guys have any questions, uh, concerns, critiques, reputations about what I just said before we begin? Oh, no? Are we good? All right, bismillah, alhamdulillah. Again, uh, okay, hold on. Okay. There we go. All right, bismillah. Uh, can I get the clicker so we can? All right, what is a man or a woman in Islam? Gender roles in the contemporary world. Bismillah. Oh, not bad. I don't know what I just did. Did I just like destroy this whole thing? Oh, okay. MashaAllah. Uh, there we go. Beautiful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it emphatically clear. And again, I, I, I think, I guess these are, and this is an important preliminary remark. What I'm presenting today is the normative Islamic understanding of this topic. Okay? Do exceptions exist? Exceptions always exist. Our fuqaha never ever ignored those. It's in uh, uh, every conception of our Islamic law that we, we, we take exceptions seriously. Um, are there better ways to frame this discussion? Most likely. Okay? But I think it's important to understand that what, what I'm presenting is simply orthodox, normative Islam's position on this topic, okay? As I understood it and as I was trained to understand it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَعْدَ أَدُوا بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شَطَانَ الرَّجِيمِ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّا كَرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, just translated here as, O people, indeed we have created you from a male and a female and made you into peoples and tribes so that you may get to know one another. Surely the most notable of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous or mindful of God amongst you. Allah is truly the all-knowing and the all-aware. Now, two things, is, two, two things are established here from this verse very, very quickly. Number one, there is a definitive, definitive, normative, objective distinction between who a male and a female is. What a male and a female is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes that very, very clear. No amount of, you know, fancy hermeneutics is going to change what is said here. Okay? Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which I find to be the most beautiful aspect of this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps frame our differences by way of what? Does he say that they are a threat to one another? Does he say that they are a challenge to one No. He says that this unique concept of a male and unique concept of a female is actually a one that enhances each other's existence. That's the second thing is established. The third thing is established in this verse is that the concept of value has nothing to do with those unique differences. So, and, and honestly, like if we just stopped here, I think that would be a beneficial reminder. That intrinsically, right, intrinsically, our value is not rooted in the differences between men and women. Intrinsically, our value is rooted in what we call taqwa, which is one of those impossible to translate words and has so many different dimensions, right? But this idea of righteousness, upright, moral uprightness, uh, 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 mindfulness of Allah. And the most beautiful thing about that is what? Your unique differences cannot determine or cannot tell for anyone if you have more taqwa than the other person. So I can't look at you and be like, ah, this person is dressed in a certain way. This person, they must have less taqwa than this person. You can't do that. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ clearly states, a taqwa hahuna in the heart. Taqwa is in the heart. And what that does is it makes it impossible for us to essentially judge, judge one another when it comes to salvation, when it comes to our, our, our moral standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any questions before I, I move on on this? Okay, good. You're going to notice with the hard slides, I'm not going to say if you have any questions. I'm just going to go. <laughs> All right, bismillah. Oh, I screwed it up again. My bad. All right. Islam is what I like to say is a balance between uh, social constructivism and moral absolutism. Two big words. You don't need to like know them very deeply. One is a, a modality, is a, is, a, is, a, is a posture about the world that says everything about the world and our existence in it, right, uh, is socially constructed, meaning that there's no essential meaning to anything. There's no essential understanding to anything. Everything is in the eye of the beholder, okay? Uh, everything is in the conception of the of 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 the of whoever's subjective we don't believe that uh, 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 we dictate everything that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dictating certain facts that are unchangeable social constructivism nothing's unchangeable Everything is in flux. Everything is open to change. Again, these are like my very, very fluffy definitions, okay? We're not, I'm sure there are far better definitions. And MashaAllah, Dr. Ali, how are you doing? Dr. Ali is a hero of mine, actually. And now I, I actually don't want to keep speaking <laughs> because he's here. Um, but Allah, forgive me for speaking in, in front of you. Um, and you, Sayyidah. Um, so... To continue, moral absolutism is basically the opposite of that. Everything is morally definitive. There's no leeway, right? Um, th there's no uh, uh, gray area, nothing. It's just pure moral absolutes all the way through, okay? Which again, 
is first of all impossible. No religious tradition can claim that. And thankfully in Islam, we don't have this idea of everything being morally absolute in the sense that there is some leeway for culture, for social constructivism. There is some leeway for that. So both are these extremes that Islam is in the beautiful balance of. Allah creates men and women uniquely. I'm gonna give a few uh, uh, important things uh, uh, so that we can continue our, you know, the, the discussion. Look, the idea of male, a, a man and a woman being different in terms of biological sex, I mean, no one who really disagrees with that is taken seriously. I have an imam friend that's actually a gender studies major, which is like really hilarious. It's, it's hilarious to be, I, I mean, I, I, it's not hilarious, it's actually amazing. <laughs> but, you know, I used to be like, you know, subhanAllah, you're the only imam that thought to do this. Um, yeah, he's a gender studies major and you know, I would consult him about these things in terms of when, when he was studying and he's like, look man, even like for the most part in academia, the idea that biological sex is also just completely fluid, that there's no way to distinctly uh, uh, talk about it, it's not something that we should even entertain here uh, because most people don't take that seriously. And by most people, you don't have to be a PhD to like, it's just common sense, right? There is physical differences between a man and a woman okay now the real conversation in our time is about how you identify right this is what we call gender gender is how how what we call ourselves manifests in the world in our dealings with one another so when i say i'm a man how does that manifest in practice right if i'm identifying as a man if i identify as a woman how does it actually play out in practice that is what we, that, that's the realm of gender. Now, what do we say Islam is a balance of? Social constructivism, moral absolutism. From the Muslim worldview, gender, the idea of gender, has both moral absolutes to it, and on top of that, there is far, so much more leeway than we understand uh, 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 due to our, due to the just, just cultural developments, okay? It is that balance in between. Now, for those who argue that no, gender is completely fluid and biological sex has nothing to do with it, I say three things. Number one, we know, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that we're unique. When we start to claim that men and women are exactly alike, that actually is not a good thing. That's a value deficit. What we're saying is that there is no uniqueness. What we're saying is that if a man or a woman is uniquely positioned by Allah in a beautiful way, we strip that away because we want to say we're completely alike. This is the whole equity versus equality conversation. Where's your hand if you've heard that before? Equality versus equity. Right? Equality being we're exactly alike, which is again biologically and as we're going to determine more than biologically, that's not true. But also equity is this idea that yes, men and women are, 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 are given uh, uh, equal opportunity to fundamental rights that they have. We do have a conception of fundamental rights. By the way, you see the Roth Institute, mashallah. This is my friends. This is a part of, I just uh, replicated the slides because I didn't have time to make my own. So uh, I, uh, I, I used the same template. He, um, Sheikh Alqam Rashid, may Allah bless him and reward him. This is, I, I, this is the, the first time I gave this was in Philly at a university. Um, he's actually doing his PhD on this uh, uh, concept, inshallah. So stay tuned for it in the Sulfiq. Um, uh, that was just a way of thanking him, inshallah, in public. Um, in addition to that, even if you look and you try to say, if you have true equity, this is an argument that people make, if you have true equity, a truly equitable society, then you will see that there will be no differences in how the roles of men and women in society play out. Okay, so not only again, from the Muslim worldview, from Quran, Sunnah, from the idea, from our scripture, that is not true. There are some moral absolutes, but even as someone who's not religious, one of the studies that uh, I saw recently is they looked at, I don't know if it's Scandinavia, or basically the most equitable society in the world. And obviously it's going to be a Western one because that's the framework, right? So the most equitable kind of society in the world where there's 
equal opportunity across the board. Do you know what they found out? Study after study, they found out that women were gravitating towards particular careers and men were gravitating towards particular careers. They're not primed. They're not for so for someone who are you all, they're just classically conditioned to do this. Why? Well, what, this is the most equitable society by these standards. What classical conditioning? And on top of that, and then this is the last thing I'll say. If we if we if we're honest with ourselves, this stuff never plays out like that in society. Like when we actually have real experience, I'm not talking about exceptions now. We're going to get to this later. We're talking about as it plays out for the most part in society. We know for a fact, we won't know all the details of it, but we have a sense as men and women, there are differences almost innately when it comes to our roles and how, our gender, right? And how that plays out in society, okay? So I, again, you know, this is a much longer conversation. I find that, I find the idea that gender is purely fluid to be utterly uncompelling. Uh, I don't see that the, the evidence points to this in any way. And just by basic common sense, if we prove that biological sex differences are real, do you really think that's not going to impact anything in society? I mean, just, just think about that, right? Uh, uh, to use, forgive me, like a, like a crude example, and I, I apologize if this offends anyone, but the, the WNBA exists for a reason. And, and again, this is, a, this is one of those like, uh, examples that just allows us to think, right? In society, if we're honest, it doesn't play out this way. The idea that gender is purely fluid, that anyone, irrespective of their biological sex, can simply identify as whatever. Now, again, gender dysphoria is real. Uh, exceptions, real. All that's real. We're not here to downplay that. But what we're saying is that there's ample evidence outside, extra, spiritual, extra scripturally, for the idea that no, not only biological sex grounded, right, uh, as distinct, which is obvious, but also gender. Inshallah, we'll go to the next slide. I went to the previous slide. My bad. Now, what is, and this is the exciting part, what is the primary relationship between men and women? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, uh, which is translated as the believers, both men and women are guardians of one another. Oh, yeah, another impossible word to translate. It has so many different connotations. Uh, uh, protective friends and guardians, uh, protectors, helpers, all of this is encapsulated, encapsulated in this idea of, of, of wali or awliya. And it's used in different contexts. It's used differently in spirituality, which still relates to this. You all know that. They encourage good and forbid evil, establish prayer and pay the zakat, obey Allah and His Messenger. It is they who will be shown Allah's mercy. Surely Allah is almighty, all wise. What are the dimensions of awliya or wilaya? It's three. And we get this from this verse. Number one. Oh, my bad. What am I doing? I, I apologize. I'm going to just leave this quick right over here. I'm having too much fun with this quiz. Does this have one of those laser things? It does? It does. Oh, yeah, maybe it does, but you don't want to know that. <laughs> okay. Because I'll be like pointing at Do you have a question? Uh, I get too much fun with these tools. Um, first... Actually, let's, let's talk about the dimensions, and I'll tell you why I have fitna in the middle. Number one, the idea of collaborating for good against evil, that's very reflective in the verse. That men and women have a complementary relationship, which we'll hear about later from our teacher. And they're collaborators for good and collaborators against evil. That they work together in this complementary relationship for that. Number two, they are guardians, protectors of one's hearts. Meaning, understanding the unique sensitivities of one another and honoring that in our character. But not only that, they're guardians and protectors of one's bodies. That physically, there are certain mandates that, 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 uh, um, that when we show up physically, we're not just thinking of ourselves. We're thinking of this complementary relationship. How, and this is... This is accepted as a golden rule when we don't talk about gender. So why is it that when it comes to gender, we toss this golden rule out? Do you know what golden rule I'm talking about? Treat others as though you want to be treated. 
your actions have consequences on those around you. We're cool with all that. But for some reason, and we're going to get to this in a second. Actually, we'll go to it now. Actually, not yet. <laughs> for some reason, when it comes to this conversation, and I get it, it's a hard conversation. I, I apologize you know, uh, 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 if, I, uh, if I say anything throughout the night that triggers you in any way, I know how intense this conversation is for many of us. And I don't mean to, to offend anyone, but the truth is true. Al-haqq al 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 insha'Allah. That when it comes to this conversation, we don't want to talk about self-responsibility anymore. We don't want to talk about the potential consequences of our actions on other people, right? Now it's flipped, and we're going to get to that in a second. But before that, why is fitna in the middle? I find this ayah to be one of the most, my bad, let me go back. I find this ayah to be one of the most foundational ayahs to understand a functional society. And I truly believe that discord fundamentally in society, that's what fitna is. Fitna is what? Discord, corruption, uh, uh, haphazard, like when everything's all over the place, right? Fitna. That comes when we undermine this fundamental relationship. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet Sallallahu wouldn't speak about it in this way. There are many reports that talk about fitna in regards to gender. Now, the reason I have this in the middle is because there's a common myth and misconception that fitna to prevent discord, morally and otherwise, that's the responsibility of who? Women. That, that they're the ones responsible to prevent fitna. And as an imam, I'm very sensitive to this. How many times, Shaykh, how many times have we tried to do such simple arrangements to uplift, you know, the experience of our woman in Masajid only to hear fitna? Habibi, fitna is not one-sided. Fitna is two ways. And you... Claiming that they are the result of fitna is the fitna. That's the real fitna. So when we understand the concept of wilaya, we both have a responsibility to one another. And by the way, this goes the other way, and I'm going to show you now. How does it go the other way? Oh, no, my goodness. All right, here we go. One of the common uh, uh, trends of you know, modern existence is this idea of like selfish individualism. I'm going to do what I want to do, you deal with it. You know what I'm talking about? Do what I want to do, you deal with it. Okay? Like I said, this stuff goes both ways. So this idea that I'm going to show up however I want to show up, I'm going to completely ignore your biological differences and your cultural differences, and you deal with it. You lower your gaze, which is true. In many cases, that's what we have to tell people. Right? That's not her responsibility now, it's your responsibility. Like in the context of a masjid. Is she dressing modestly? Yes. Is she in a place that the Prophet ﷺ allowed in the masjid? Yes. Then you need to stay quiet and you need to guard your gaze now. That's your responsibility to prevent discord, not hers. But it goes both ways. The idea, and I hear this a lot, I hear this a lot. It's like in popular culture, take out Muslim community. In popular culture you hear this. It's like, I can dress however I want, and you deal with it. That's not a relationship that is complementary. That is a selfish, individualistic relationship, right? And again, we don't accept this in any other area or conversation of life. This is the interesting thing about this, is that if you go to work and say, sorry, boss, I'm not doing my assignment, you deal with it. Okay, I will. You're fired. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, you want to do that? Go ahead. Do that on someone else's time. We're fine accepting this in all conversations, but when it comes to this, because of, of, of popular cultural norms, we're very scared to admit that it applies to this too. You can't just show up physically or emotionally in any way that you want and say, you deal with it. Right? I'm going to yell at you. I'm going to scream at you. I'm going to call you names. You deal with it. No, 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 no. You stop the name call. That's your responsibility. You can't just cast dispersions and call people names and show up however way you want and then say, you deal with it. This is not the framework of Islam. And, and I put this hadith, I just, I don't know why. I, I connected to this hadith when I was thinking about this, where the Prophet ﷺ says, whoever supports his brother or sister behind their back 
in their absence, Allah will support them in the world and in the hereafter. This is in their absence. Imagine in their presence. This is a commandment to do so in their absence. Imagine in their presence and how important that is. All right, bismillah. Oh, no, we skipped one. Oh, did we not skip? Oh, no, there was just a double. Sorry, guys. I'm very, like, informal up here. <laughs> I, I, I know I'm supposed to be, like, less of that, but this is the way I am. As my father says, take it or leave it. What is a Muslim man? Uh, this is my framework. Um, in fact, the more I think about it, and maybe our teachers here can help me redevelop it, uh, the, the more maybe I'm making this more complicated than it should be. But this is my framework to, to talk about kind of this, this uniqueness that we're alluding to. When it comes, and I'm talking about what is a Muslim man, because I'm a man, and we have our teacher here, who is a woman, inshallah she'll address uh, uh, the idea of what it means to be a Muslim woman. Um, but uh, what, what I want to accomplish with, with this talk is to just give you tools to be able to understand how to have this conversation and understand this discussion. When it comes to a Muslim man, for example, there's outward responsibilities and inward responsibilities. When it comes to outward responsibilities, some are divinely ordained. What did we say what that meant? Morally absolute. Some are not morally absolute. Some lean to social uh, uh, custom, right? What's an example? According to the religion of Islam, and I don't know of any scholar that's really disagreed with this, I don't know, I, I'm pretty sure it's in jama' on this issue, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says, nisa, that men are the, 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 the um, caretakers of women, almost every scholar that I know understood that to mean that men, fundamentally, for you to call yourself a man, you are divinely obligated to take care of the provision of your wife, for example. And there are different, like, what is that mean? The fuqaha have had all these fascinating discussions on, like, what is provision? You know, uh, 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 what, are the met what, what are the limits of that? Or that, That's not what we have to go into. Just what we're saying, generally speaking, that's a moral absolute. So a man, a man can't say, oh, but we live in contemporary times, sister. So, you know, I don't have to provide for you. You can't say that. Now, what's interesting is, this goes to custom. Can a man stay at home and a woman work full time? Raise your hand if you say, yes. Raise your hand if you say, absolutely not. Well, billah. Maybe not all of that. Right? <laughs> That's how we feel when we say it, right? Well, billah. What kind of, you know, in Syrian culture, this would be like, this would be like, uh, 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 you'd be anathematized culturally, like, like blasphemy. How, you, don't, you can't, you're no longer a Syrian. What do you mean, say, stay at home? Well, billah. That's, again, but interestingly, Custom allows for these unique arrangements as long as a man understands that still fundamentally you're the one responsible. Now if you as a married couple have a different arrangement, custom allows for that. This is what we call al-ada. We're going to get to that in a second. Now another example of that is the mahr. So we said some things are divinely absolute. Some things have so much leeway for mahr. For, for <laughs> Was that a Freudian slip or something? <laughs> like, which one of you uh, put this? Some have leeway when it comes to custom. Should the mahr be $200,000? Is that acceptable? Raise your hand if you say, mahr can be $200,000. Raise your hand if you say, unequivocal, <laughs> Never. Some of you say yes. In our time, <laughs> No, it's custom. You, you, you th $200,000 mahr for two billionaire families is what? Yeah, and that's like ten dollars for me, you know what I mean? That's like nothing, right? So again, you find that there are things that are morally absolute, but then have this leeway when it comes to custom. The same thing, the same thing applies to inward responsibilities. What are examples of that? One of the ayahs of the Quran 
were revealed in response to a claim a woman made to the Prophet ﷺ, that she was complaining. Allah heard this complaint, right? Who who knows uh, uh, which which ayah this is? This is in Surah Mujadila, right? Surah Baba, correct me if I'm wrong. Allahu. There he goes. There you go. This is one of my fathers here. I always joke he's my insurance. Because I know I'm going to mess up. And so at least you heard Quran and you can feel like you got something. You know what I mean, if this is a fail, you've got to hear Quran from the shortest sentence to the Prophet. The Prophet, uh, um, uh, 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 a woman complained to him. Why? Because the man divorced her in a way that was unacceptable. So what we learn is that as a, as a divinely ordained characteristic that a man is supposed to have fairness, the opposite to fahush, right? This idea of like, of, of, of um, uh, uh, divorcing, right? In a way that breaks her heart, in a way that, that, that abuses her, right? Similarly, what is that? We, we talked about the action, but that is rooted in what? That's a word rooted in an inward quality. That a man, for him to be a man, is required to have. This is why, in Syrian culture, if you do something like this, right, that isn't, uh, uh, that isn't indicative of just a wrong action that you did. That is indicative of a failure internally as a man. That you have, you're missing a quality that would make you a man, Islamically speaking. When it comes to custom, though, so like, you know, emotional, emotional intelligence, right? What does that look like? How do we measure that? What type of, you know, emotional intelligence? Uh, how do we even understand that in the context of a relationship with a man? All of this is open to, to, to custom and conversation. Because we're running out of time. Some myths versus realities before we get to the tools and we'll finish, inshallah, in the next three, four minutes. Which means like the next 10, 15 minutes. Number one, the idea that a man, because for me, like, like uh, we don't have enough time to, 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 to curate uh, um, or describe like the essential, what is Islamic, like, quote unquote, masculinity, whatever that word means, right? You know, uh, uh, Sheikh and I were talking about like how, you know, when we end up using some of these terms that may not exist, exist in our lexicon, in our, in our, in our framing, we end up. Uh, uh, being pulled into conversations that don't even apply to us, right? But anyway, right, we don't have time for that. So one of the easiest ways is to maybe just look at some myths and realities, dispel some of them. One of them is the idea that a man is defined by their physical strength. What does the Prophet ﷺ say? The Prophet ﷺ defined quote-unquote masculinity or manhood or ma ma manliness not by physical strength. In fact, he spoke against it. He said... A man, a true man, is not one who overpowers someone physically. He said a true man is one who what? Controls his anger. What would our state be as a community if we taught our children? Do you know what it means to be a true man? To not act upon your emotions reactively. Imagine how much abuse we could avoid. How much... How, much, uh, uh, um, how many problems would be warded off if we just taught our children? You know what it means to be a true man? It's to learn how to control those impulse, impulses. To not react to those feelings that are intense uh, uh, within you. And of course we should be teaching our women that too. Another myth, men cannot express emotions or cry. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was not just crying every single day until he met Allah. In Qiyamul Layl. His beard would be filled with tears, and people could notice it. But some say, and I heard this recently, oh, those are spiritual tears. Right? <laughs> that doesn't mean men should show emotion or be vulnerable. Okay. The Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, when burying one of his sons, he started to tear up and cry. And one of the Arabs, because maybe that was his understanding, well, that's not a spiritual tear. What's going on over here? He goes and he says, Ya Rasulullah, you cry? What did the Prophet ﷺ say? He said, these tears that you see are a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, myth dispelled, this idea that a man... But again, there's custom involved here, 
right? How this happens is it's very important to invoke custom. You know, if, if, if a man, I'm just, I'm just telling, I'm just being real with you. If a man, you know, just starts crying in public amongst another, a bunch of strangers that are also men, that's probably not a great idea, you know, just because that's a sign of weakness. So, and then how that's determined, again, goes back to cultural custom, which we're, Islam is very sensitive to. Thirdly, that men are inherently violent, right? That, that, that men, uh, 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 the reality is that men may have certain proclivities that are more intense in them as opposed to women, vice versa, right? But this idea is because we don't teach people that being a true man means to feel those things and not react. We have that the idea of men's needs are completely different than women's needs. This is the controversial part of the talk. So forgive me in advance. One of a problematic thing that we, we, have, we have maybe, I don't know how to put this. Something problematic that I think is problematic is the way that we talk about marriage from the Muslim worldview and the arrangement of a nikah, for example. You hear a lot of people say, oh, nikah is nothing more than the exchange of money for what? You know the rest, for intimacy. So the man gives money, the woman gives intimacy. One of my teachers, uh, um, who is one of the great muftis and scholars of the Hanafi school, he told me actually, contrary to popular belief, many scholars and fuqaha rejected this definition of nikah. And they said, no, it's, uh, 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 it's, it's enjoyment for both. That they said, a, a nikah, the mahar was just a gift, but it wasn't an exchange for services for the man. They said that a nikah is a, a, a the gift is a formality, the mahar is a formality for one to fulfill each other's needs, which are very similar, right? That, that, that there, there's this myth, and, and Sheikh is more qualified to talk about this because she's the one who taught me this, that, 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 that there's studies that show that this, this idea of like sexual desire being so much greater in men than women, right? Many studies are saying, no, that, that, that there's very similar uh, uh, um, uh, um, proclivities in that regard, right? But then again, these framings, these framings have profound implications on how men see themselves in society. This is why you get these terms toxic masculinity, which I, I think is a silly term because like true masculinity can be toxic, right? It's like a, it's almost like an oxymoron, but these are the terms that, that are, the, that are used. This comes from a, a, a misunderstanding of these things. And then finally, some may argue that defined standards are limiting when it comes to gender. So I, I just, you know, I want to define what it means for me to be a man, right? I say it's the exact opposite. Defined standards are some of the most freeing things ever because Islam says, look, here are the things that are fixed. Beyond that, we default to custom. Everyone's different. You have personality. But when you say nothing is defined, nothing is absolute, that creates far more anxiety and anguish in a person than having some defined standards. And again, you don't have to be a Muslim to see this. You don't have to, don't take my word for it. Go do some Googling. Ask shiuch and experts here. Ask your teachers. They'll tell you, study after study. I'm a training psychologist. Make dua, I'm almost done. It's going to take me between uh, uh, 3 and 25 years. <laughs> you know, because dissertat dissertations are... Right, but like, look at these psychological studies. Like, if you, if, if we, we have to ask this question. We have to ask this question. If, if this, if this, this hurriya, this freedom, this unprecedented freedom is truly a benefit, why is everything wrong increasing? We've more freedom than we've ever had. We're more connected than we've ever been. The list goes on. So at some point you have to say, hmm, maybe too many unrestricted options aren't a good thing. There's a book on this called The Paradox of Choice. I don't, raise your hand if you've heard of this. Of course, Bay Area. This is, you know where I first heard this? I was like a teenager. And I was watching a Sheikh Hamza lecture. And then he referenced it. And because, you know, I was trying to be a nerd, a failed nerd at that time. I immediately looked it up. I was like, wow, that was one of the most blind-blowing concepts. I was just like, whoa, 
choice isn't always good. Noted. You know what I mean? Like that, that explains 95% of my current suffering as a teenager. Um, so what I want to do now to, to conclude, I want to share with you two principles that help us have this discussion. And I keep doing the wrong way. Number one, we have a principle in Islamic law that says, الحكم لا يدور حول الاستثناء. That is a ruling that divine law, sacred law, they're not formed on the basis of exceptions. This is essential to understand if you want to be sensitive in having this conversation. Do exceptions exist to everything I said? Yes, absolutely, including gender. But Islamic law does not legislate on the basis of exceptions because that is one of the reasons for discord. When you say, we're going to take this exception and we're going to subjugate the vast majority to that exception, that is when you, that is by the way, in my opinion, this is my opinion, now you can take it or completely leave it, it doesn't bother me, but I'm just telling you, this is my opinion, I believe so much of the discord in Western contemporary society is because we failed in understanding it. That if you take an exceptional circumstance, because Islam says, for exceptions, what do we do? Do we ignore them? No. We honor them, we show sensitivity and kindness to them. One of the most beautiful things that I saw, I only went to Damascus once. I grew up here. I went to Damascus once. I was a 15 year old. One of the most beautiful things that I saw was that people that, had, that were exceptional on the mental scale, right, autistic or, you know, clearly had almost a level of insanity. They roamed the streets comfortably and everyone knew what to do. And what was that? They all showed them love and kindness whenever he, I remember, this is one of the most vivid moments I ever had in Syria. As I, I came out of Jamia, the Jamia Abu Nur, I came outside, I can't feed the can Abi, can it's it, it makes me tear up thinking about this. And someone with like Down syndrome, right, uh, was talking to the Deccan, and there was like a group of four people just entertaining him. How are you? You are king. You are our prince. Here's, here's free snacks. That blew my mind, right? So just because we don't take exceptions and subjugate the majority to them doesn't mean we don't show sensitivity and we don't humanize people that are going and suffering through being an exception to some of these rules, right? Al-hukmu la yaduru al istithna hawla al istithna because that would be injustice. Now, related to this, what is the divine framework? What does it mean to be a man? The simple answer is the Prophet Muhammad That's the simple answer. What did the Prophet Muhammad do? What did he not do? Now, this idea of sunnah, the divine framework of that, because the sunnah is scriptural. It's not, you know, you don't have Quran and sunnah as two completely distinct I shouldn't say anything, this is Dr. Ali's here. But you, what I'm trying to say, he's the scholar in, in regards to this, but it, w what I'm trying to say is that sunnah is, is divinely ordained. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Qul, Allah wa Qul, uh, Obey Allah and obey the messenger uh, uh, of Allah. So the divine framework is very simple. There are things that are explicitly allowed. In other words, there are things that are explicitly morally absolute. That's what it should say, sorry. And there are things that are explicitly forbidden, another moral absolute. In between them are a bunch of gray areas. What is in this, what, how, what mitigates these gray areas? Besides expert understanding of scripture and sunnah, the other principle, which is al adatu muhakkama. That in Islamic legal theory, again, these are, these are, Unanimously accepted principles of Islamic law. al ada muhakkama Culture, right? The idea of custom, which, you know, norms, which make up culture. They hold the weight of law. Okay? Now, what this means is, this is why I told you I don't have all the answers for you. Do you know why? Because we never will have all the answers. If we did have all the answers for everything, and, and you should reject people that talk about Islam in this way. This, this black and white, you know, uh, uh, my way is the perfect way, and I have every answer to every, th that's a huge, you know, alam <laughs> hamra. Red flag. Red flag immediately. Red flag immediately. Because 
the, 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 the Prophet Sallallahu very explicitly taught us that there will be unprecedented times that come which cause us to use our minds, have sensitive conversations, try to figure out as a collective. If everything was figured out, why are we awliya to begin with? Do you ever think about that? If everything is just pure, figured out, everything's clear, you know what to do, I know what to do. Why are we supposed to be complementary guardians of one another? Because there are things that we're not going to all figure out. That is the role of having custom and beautiful custom that is informed by our ethos, but there may be unprecedented situations that require us to do a further look. I'm going to give one example and I will conclude here, inshallah. An example, oh, an example of Ada, most commonly used word in this lecture is op. <laughs> Sorry about that, I made so many mistakes. But this is one of the, for me, this is one of the most fascinating a hadith that I've ever come across in my life because people come and tell you being a man and a woman and interacting between men and women clear it's all fixed all absolute all black and white okay you ready for the story one time and do not try this at home what I'm about to say <laughs> this is like warning do not try this at home I'm trying to under help you understand One that the Prophet also made brothers. Salman goes to the house of Abu Darda to visit. Knocks on the door. Who answers? Abu Darda's wife. And as they're waiting for Abu Darda, which is also already interesting, because she's the one who opens the door. Some say, oh, that's wal'iyadu billah. Right? Again, Ada. This, is, this, is a, this was a cultural custom. Even in Medina, people interacted differently. Even in Medina. That's the fascinating part of it. Because you had Muhajirin and Ansar, and they both had very different customs. That's why some say, I've never verified this. Our teachers can, can verify it. But I, I, I heard that, 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 that in Medina, like it was, I don't want to say it wasn't allowed, but uh, technically it was, it was almost not allowed if you married a woman from Medina to marry another wife, to have a second wife, because it was against their cultural custom. Well, I have not personally verified this in the sources, but this is something that I heard from reputable teachers uh, of mine. So she, he, 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 she opens the door, and do you know what he tells her? Again, do not try this at home. He says, مَا شَأْنُكِ مُتَبَدِّلَ why are you looking like this? I don't know how else. I, I, I don't know how to translate this in a, in a, like a nice way, but it's like, so how, I, don't, I really don't know what to say. It's like, it's like, why are you dressed in this way? Why, why are you looking clearly? Yeah, I don't want to. I'm scared to use that word. Why are you, why are you looking like not like the princess that you are? I don't know, <laughs> like shabby. Why are you? Why are you? Why are you looking? You know, almost destitute, right? So, do you know what she says? Again, look at this interaction. This is, this is a non-mahra. She says, you know Abu Darda. He has no care for this dunya. Almost like jokingly, like, you know Abu Darda. He's only concerned with the akhirah and doesn't have time to, to, concern, to be concerned with these things for both of us. It was this statement that caused Salman to spend the entire day with his friend Abu Darda, who's his brother, spiritually speaking. And this is the story where we get the famous, famous hadith. What's that famous hadith? Let's continue the story. Abu Darda, uh, uh, Salman, they have lunch, and Salman decides to stay the night. Abu Darda prepares, you know, uh, 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 you know accommodations for him in the same house. And Abu Darda leaves, and Salman says, where are you going? He says, you know, it's after Isha, I'm going to go and do my Qiyam al -Layl. Salman says, no, you're going to sleep with me. Meaning, you're going to sleep, you're going to sleep at this time. He says, okay, fine. So he sleeps. He wakes up in the uh, uh, first uh, uh, third of the night. Salman says, what are you doing? He says, I'm going to have to do some tahajjud. He says, nope, you're going to sleep. And I'm going to sleep too. He wakes up in the second third of the night. What are you doing? I want to pray. Nope, you're going to sleep and I'm going to sleep. Then, again, I'm paraphrasing. You can see the Arabic here on purpose because I want you to have the direct, the direct source. 
He says, he gets up in the third of the night. He says, we'll get up in the third of the night and we'll pray together. So they prayed together. They prayed Fajr. And then he tells his friend Abu Dada, no, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it says it right here, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a right upon you, your family has a right over you, and your nafs, your own self, has a right over you. And then the Prophet sallallahu then affirms what Salman says to Abu Dada. What is this an example of? Am I saying go and do that? To Absolutely not. If you did this, this would be a huge problem in many cultures. But what I'm showing you is that even in Medina, there was so much leeway for custom to hold the weight of law and, 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 and um, acceptable interaction between men and women, which we can overextend more generally to say that, look, again, what's the major principle you learned here? There's things that are morally absolute, and there are things that are in the realm of custom. Both have to be honored. Neither can be undermined for us to prevent discord and to be true awliya of one another. And I'm going to hand the mic to our dear teacher. I'm so sorry for taking so much time. Um, Abu Darda. Yeah, this is, this is Abu Darda. I don't know why I put Abu Dar. Forgive me. I want to reassure everyone I'm not going to take very long because I know, like myself, we all want to continue listening to you, Imam Ahmed. So, um, inshallah, Jazakumullah Khair, and what an incredible presentation. And I have to just tell everyone the way that this event um, culminated. Imam Ahmed is perfectly capable, as you just saw, to do this entire topic. I did not need to be up here, but he is, again, Imam Ahmed, Deeb, Adib, mashallah, beautiful adab. So he basically refused <laughs> to come without allowing me to also speak. Um, so I really just feel like this is an add-on. But standing alone or as is, as what you presented, really was enough. Mashallah, it was beautiful. Jazakumullah khairan. And we're going to have a Q&A session after this. We're probably going to go until about 7.50, which is the Adhan for Aisha. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll have a Q&A, inshallah. So, um, and I'm really hoping that Dr. Ali will join us for the Q&A. No pressure, but um, mashallah, you're here. And it's an honor for us. All of you being here is an honor for us. But when our teachers are here, we have to, inshallah, uh, invite them. And, and it would be an honor for, for all of us to learn from you as well. So we can uh, do that at the Q&A. So for my portion, again, this is an additional information. Uh, but really, the presentation was just so comprehensive, mashallah, barakallahu um, feekum. Really, this is something I put together for, uh, you know, for college students, really. But I do feel that everything that I'm about to present is so relevant given all that was discussed, that we are living in such contentious times, times where these topics are so politicized. And I work with youth. I hear all about it all the time from sisters and young girls that I work with. They're very curious and confused about what Islam has to say about a lot of topics that relate to women, um, but also just gender, this concept of gender. So whatever you know, conversations we can have around this topic are so relevant. I want to really, again, thank Imam Ahmed for being so... Um, thoughtful and uh, you know having the foresight to put together such a wonderful presentation and then bringing it to us so may Allah bless you and of course your beloved father um, and may Allah return you to our community again and again and again this is just the, the beginning inshallah um, alhamdulillah so with that said um, does this work for me too Ima? yeah it does okay great thank you all right so bismillah okay so the first thing I wanted to share is actually a quote um, that was posted in the Daily Beast. And this is just for us to really understand why we have to talk about women in Islam and really have, be in control of the narrative because this is uh, the reality that we're up against, right? Muslim women have been wrongly painted for decades in our country as universally oppressed and silent. Partly that's because of the outrageous real life policies of Muslim nations like Saudi Arabia, but also it's due to Hollywood feeding us a diet of Muslim women depicted in movies and TV shows as fearful, timid, and covered in a burqa whose only sound is ovulating. You know, this is the uh, sound that women from different Arab countries make when they're, you know, celebrating. I'm sorry? 
Yes, okay, I'm, I'm not familiar with, okay, alhamdulillah, thank you for that, yes. So, you know, they themselves recognize that, you know, Muslim women have been depicted wrongly for so long, and it's important, again, to depict or, or to, uh, to uh, help us to discern what, what is true and what isn't and, and to, um, you know, address those myths. So let's first start off with the facts, what we should know about Muslim women. And this is across the board. Men should know this, women should know this, young girls should know this, boys should know this. We should have no uh, difference of, of opinion on these matters, that, alhamdulillah, Muslim women absolutely have many rights in Islam. Um, the fact that I'm sitting up here is a proof of that. The fact that there are so many beautiful sisters here, sitting here, all came with their own agency, their own, you know, they were able to come here. It's a proof of that. But there are many other proofs. Um, another fact is that many Muslim women's rights are actually violated across the world. And we have to be honest. We have to have honest conversations around this. We can't just gloss over the realities that our mothers, our grandmothers, and even women today, of course, are dealing with in terms of the oppressive nature of certain cultural beliefs, right, that perpetuate misogynistic rules, customs, or unjust laws and policies, all of which directly conflict with Islamic principles about women's inherent values and rights. So we have to be clear that that's a, that's a truth. And then that Muslim women disproportionately suffer more consequence, consequences from Islamophobia than Muslim men. And that's because we're more visibly Muslim, right? People can see us. So a man can has that privilege of being able to move through society and nobody would know whether he's Muslim or not because now, for example, the beard is trending, right? There's a whole, the, it's, what is it, the, uh, the, what is it called? I forgot now, but there's a whole movement, right, where, the, the hipster, the hipster movement, right? I was where, basically a <laughs> Were you? <laughs> but I, my name was Ahmed, so I'll give it away. <laughs> There you go. So yeah, he could get away with pretending to be just another hipster, millennial, um, you know, Latino, getting, you know, following a trend. We don't have that luxury. Work unless you know. I mean, sure, you can style your hijab differently, but most of the time, people understand that you are a Muslim and that's your faith. So, um, and then the, you know, the other things that we also have to be mindful of is again, the rights that uh, that women have. Um, world, you know, in Islam are not always given and they are violated as we mentioned. But let's talk about other things that in my experience just hearing from women, from hearing from young girls that they also feel is missing as a missing piece of the conversation that we openly address that yes, there are for example double standards, right? So there's a mistreatment that a lot of young girls and women experience due to the gender disparity. So in households, you know, boys will, for example, be given preferential treatment, they'll have more opportunities, they'll be able to have more social mobility, less household chores, right? Raise your hands, am I talking the truth, girls, right? All of this is real, a lot of us experience this growing up. And I could, you know, spend a lot of time telling you about my chore list versus my brother's, which there was not basically. <laughs> Uh, but delayed curfews, right? And then girls are also held to a stricter code of conduct. So that's true. That's just a real experience that a lot of Muslim women have. They're, uh, in some cases, denied access to education, Islamic and or secular. I've lived that reality, um, and I know others have as well. Forced marriages without their consent and prevention from divorce, lack of employment opportunities and or financial abuse from family members or spouse, or forced labor without compensation, lack of basic civil liberties or the right to participate in public or social life, forced cultural practices related to female uh, you know, sexuality like FGM, forced hijab or niqab, physical, mental, emotional, uh, or spiritual abuse from relatives, including parents, siblings, spouses, extended relatives, we can go on and on. These are the lived experiences of women. And this isn't, you know, exclusive to Muslim women, but we have to be real that these things absolutely do occur. Now, with that said, um, we also have to understand that Muslim women in the U.S. are experiencing unprecedented challenges, right? So when we look at uh, the research here, for example, 57, the majority of Muslim women versus 43% of men, Muslim men, say that it's become more difficult to be Muslim in, in the U.S. in recent years. Because we are bearing the burden, right? We are the ones that are attacked. And I, I mean, I have had, I've written, if you follow me on social media, plenty of uh, Facebook posts over the years about the different, you know, um, either microaggressions or actual attacks or perceived, you know, uh, very, very, I mean, clearly examples of Islamophobia toward myself that I've had to deal with, but I know many others who've had very similar experiences. 
So that's one thing. And then 83% of Muslim women versus 68%, look at the numbers, look at the difference, said that there was a lot of discrimination against Muslims because they're on the receiving end of that. And then 55% of Muslim women versus 42% of men say that they've experienced at least one of several specific types of anti-Muslim discrimination. So these are, again, we have to familiarize ourselves with this because we need to empathize and also just have, again, honest conversations around the experiences of Muslim women in the world and here at home. Now, to the real stuff, because this is what we have to do. We are, again, living in times where there's a lot of people who want to speak on our behalf, but it is so important for Muslim women to be empowered, to have their own voice, and to basically take back the narrative, mm-hmm. right, so that we don't have people just using us, which is what they're doing. In many cases, they use our, uh, you know, our, our, um, our status, right, as a marginalized community or as a member of society that is often, and in many cases, as we just read, sometimes mistreated. So they will use that to their advantage, but it is, it's very important for us to have our own narrative and to assert our own truth. So this is where, you know, mashallah, again, Imam Ahmed's presentation was so comprehensive, but it's so important for us to address what it means to be a woman, not from the lens of modernity and politics, but to go back to the ultimate source, which is the Qur'an, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, right, وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرَ كَالْأُنْثَى And the male is not like the female. And I think that wording is so beautiful, right? Because, uh, you know, just, I mean, of course, Allah knows in His own wisdom w- the way that it was phrased, what the impl- implication is. But I do think that there's something beautiful about it that says that there are unique traits, right? Which, again, Imam Ahmed um, mentioned, that we have to honor and to... <coughs> you know, fall into this, you know, idea that we should all just be the same and to negate those beautiful differences is, again, against uh, what we are taught. And then, um, again, and of everything we've created, pairs, that you may remember the grace of Allah. I mean, another powerful verse, verse that reminds us that there is a binary, right? And we are living in a time where this idea of a binary is completely being erased. And, you know, something that Sheikh Hamza mentioned which I think is really we have to keep in mind that when you affirm this idea that everything is fluid and that there's no, you know, that there is no binary and that you allow for that, who is the only non-binary? Right? Who is the only non-binary? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to be very careful to fall into that same language, right? Uh, We believe in a binary. This is absolutely fact. We believe in that. And the idea that someone can be non-binary or that we don't need to, we need to reject these notions is again um, akin to allowing for people to define themselves on the same level or as, as though they are like godlike. And that is not our worldview, right? We reject that. Um, and so their Islam, again, the framing around men and women is complementary. It's not contentious, but we're living in a time where it's, we're being pushed into that direction to just see each other as enemies. There, there's this constant power grab between us that we should feel threatened as women by men and men should feel threatened by women and that's why we have all these movements now. We have incels and red pill and then we have mis- uh, feminists and others that are you know, going in the direction where, you know, again, it's just constant infighting and looking at each other as enemies and that is the complete opposite message of our faith which is we are a complement to each other and we don't need to fight because alhamdulillah everything is already defined for us as again Imam Ahmed mentioned you know we definitions are important and when you live in a world or in a time where you know everything's trying is is being forcibly redefined or or deconstructed then that's when you get all of this chaos mm. but our definitions are very clear around these things so we have to restore that gender balance and so we go back to you know our the Quran and, and uh, the Hadith, our uh, sacred text, to look at what, how, do, how do we restore the balance? Well, here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, right, that we are honored by Him. He is the one who's honoring us. Never will I allow the loss, uh, the loss of the work of any worker amongst you, male or female, you are of one another. So He is, you know, giving us, you know, uh, precedent. I mean, he, he's, he's mentioning both of us in this verse to say that you're, the value of what you bring is the same. There's no difference, right? That one is not preferred over the other. 
Um, and then, and for women, our rights over men, similar to those of men over women. This is real equity. This is the equity that we should look to, right? So we're not, we shouldn't look to lip service equity. We should look to real equity. This is it. Surely the men who submit and the women who submit. And the fact, I mean, this verse, and this is the verse that I thought you were asking about with Um Salama initially, but this verse also, right? This idea of, um, of you know, the men and the women being, being uh, uh, mentioned in the same context repeatedly, repeatedly. It's an honor for us as women, and we should note that because others are noting it. And here at the bottom, I just have a, a little fun fact that um, might again just, uh, inshallah, um, warm your heart to see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always trying to remind us, right, that there's no competition here. Al Rajul and Al Marra, both which mean men and women, are mentioned each 24 times in the Quran. Something that, you know, again, a little t- factoid. Yeah, this is from Dr. Uh, Selina Ibrahim in her book, The Women and Gender in the Quran. So, mashallah. And that there are 34 ayahs in the Quran where women are speaking directly. I mean, there's just so many other beautiful, um, you know, facts. This is truth that that prove that we are, in fact, honored by God. And if you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your creator, honoring you, you don't need to look to anyone else for validation or definitions about who you are. And so this fact that, that women are prioritized and given this honor what is is noted noted by people like Leslie Hazelton who actually observed that the Bible is, is exclusively and again Dr. Ali can speak more to this addressing men or, or using the second and third person masculine uh, but the Quran actually includes women and this is a distinction that we have to know so that when we're in any way you know put in a position where we feel like we're on the defensive these are the types of responses that you can just immediately shut down anybody who comes and you know tries to make a case that women are don't have rights in Islam. No, we absolutely do. And uh, you know the Prophet said so him, right? Honored by the Prophet so he said what? And for all of the parents in here, right? That what a what an incredible. I mean, I look when I think of this. I have two sons, so uh, but I still I and my father Allah who he had three daughters. So inshallah, I always look to this hadith as inshallah hope that. And hopefully that we, uh, you know, we do our part to uh, to serve him and to continue to do good, so that inshallah he can reap the benefits of raising us. Because this is such a beautiful hadith. Whoever has three daughters and he cares for them, he is merciful to them and he clothes them. Then paradise is certainly required for him. And then you know, again, this exchange that the Prophet is having with his Sahaba, and he asks, or someone asked, uh, you know, from the companions, what if the person only has two? He said, even two. Some people thought that the, if they had said to him one, that the Prophet would also have affirmed that yes, if you raised one daughter and you, you know, did your best, that inshallah that would be your ticket to Jannah. I don't know of a hadith where he talked. You know, again, subhanAllah, what a gift that, that we've been left, right? And his consistent record, again, for advocating for women. The first issues, of course, that we know that he came to immediately eradicate was a female infanticide. And then by the, the, by the end of his life in the last sermon, what was he addressing the men? He said, what? Take care of the women. Take care of the women. So this is, I mean, there's so many proofs. We're just, again, scratching the surface, but we want to leave you with that confidence that we don't have to look to anything outside of our own faith to know where we stand and what our definitions are. It's all there and it is the best. There's nothing that you can find that will come even close to what Islam teaches in terms of the fairness, the beauty of both the the male and the female. Um, And then again, I enjoin you to treat women kindly for they're your partners Mm -hmm. and committed helpers. Again, the same uh, advice that we heard, uh, uh, I mean the same um, message about being complimentary. The right to an education, we should know this because we, now, for example, I mean, I, I'm from Afghanistan, born there. I have not been back, but it's certainly I know in the past week or so, there's been so much discussion around what's happening in Afghanistan with regards to, um, you know, the education of young girls and them being preventive. And I saw the videos. It's heartbreaking to see the girl, the women in the university, the girls in the university and schools crying because they are barred from from you know knowledge this is not islam and you know i'm not going to get into a political discussion this is the proof of it the prophet sallallahu says the seeking of knowledge is obligatory for every muslim and he made the distinction man and woman he could have just left it you know ambiguous and then left it for interpretation but he himself inserted that distinction so that we know it applies to both right so that is the proof alhamdulillah within our deen again um, that we have to remember 
So the right to own property and wor work earn income, you know, we're just, again, giving very generic information here. There's much more to this, but it's enough for, I think, all of us just to have a baseline understanding that, yes, we have the right to own property, work, and earn an income, but it should be said that we also have the obligation to serve our families, mm -hmm. right? You can't, at the expense of the rights that others have over you, just, you know, completely go rogue and do your own thing. That's, that, that doesn't fly. We have social obligations, we have obligations within our family systems that we have to prioritize. And once we do that, absolutely, you can go and f fulfill your dreams, pursue your career, do all that. But your dependents and those who have rights over you, that's just, there's no argument or there's no discussion there. Um, and then, you know, mentioning here just again that the first wife of the Prophet, which we know, Khadija bint Khuwailid, that she was a very successful businesswoman and his employer before they were married. So just important little things to know if you're not familiar with the, the, the sira, these are things you should definitely know. Um, the right to vote, participate in social and public life. There are just so many proofs, but again, if you're struggling with these concepts, here are the evidences that yes, women have the right to participate in the social and public life, but all of it has to be done with you know a sense of what are your priorities, right? You cannot abandon all of the other your obligations to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, your obligations to your family, and then just throw yourself into public service. It actually doesn't make sense if you think about it, because where are you going to be asked, or what are you going to be asked about first? Your relationship with Allah. So if you don't even have any idea of your fardain, for example, you've never studied the things that you will first be asked about. Does it make sense then to? devote your entire life and all of your free time to causes we have to just learn to prioritize and and this is again where you know learning and and, and going back to the the foundations of and the principles of our faith that prioritize this type of knowledge um, comes into place but you know proofs in the quran about again uh the the um the that men and women are protectors we've we already covered that ayah but also just that we do have um, precedents, and we'll go over examples of women who were themselves politically active, right? Um, the right to choose and to be respected, uh, you know, to, to be able to have a say in your own future. This is, there's no debate here. This is absolutely a right um, that women are given, and this is a, a wonderful story that one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ named Ibn Abbas reported that a girl came to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ and that she basically reported to the Prophet ﷺ that her father had forced her to marry someone without her consent. And I love this hadith because everything about it is just is, is so um, important, especially in, in, this con in, in this time. But the Prophet ﷺ gave her a choice. When, she, when he heard her case, he said, do you want to accept the marriage or or I can nullify it for you right here and there. And she said, look at her words, and I want you to think about this, and then think about this idea that women don't have rights. She is talking to the Prophet ﷺ. First of all, she had obviously the courage to speak to him, which says that he created a society where women felt very comfortable you know, going to him with their complaints, with their grievances. It wasn't this, you know, no, you, you know, you don't have any rights. You just do as you're told and be quiet that some people, especially Orientalists and others have about Muslim women. But he actually allowed for, for these types of conversations to even occur. But look at her empowerment. She accepted the marriage. Okay. But what does she say? I wanted to let women know the parents have no right to force a husband on them. So that's the whole purpose of why she went to the Prophet Sallallahu She wanted to empower other women so that they know their rights. But she, you know, she was, you know, she was making her case. But at the end of it, her intention was that so this doesn't happen, you know, with, you know, unregulated. You know, that people just perceive that this is okay, that you should not do that, and that women should uh, speak up. And then the Prophet of course, also encouraged men to treat their spouses in the best way. The best, the most complete of believers in faith are those with the best character. And the best of you are what? Those who are best to their women and in other uh, you know, narrations to their family. But there's just so many messages that, again, if you are familiar with it, then you'll know that when it comes to um, these ideas that, again, Muslim women have limited rights, don't have rights, that you would be able to easily defend that, those arguments. But it is important to um, dispel the myths that, um, that exist. So let's look at some fact versus fiction. Um, this is something that is, you know, again, we can have, we need a whole other presentation on.
because we're living in times where there is a postmodern agenda. And many times what they do is they basically re write or reinvent or not even yeah they just distort basically everything and so they may look to different uh, parts of Islamic history and uh, you know try to find uh, cherry pick certain things and just to make cases and arguments because they're looking at it from their own lens right if you're gonna re like go, go through history but you're gonna retroactively for example apply modern conventions and, and sensibilities, a lot of things are not going to make sense. You have to understand things in their time, not like, oh, because now this is considered taboo and weird, I can go back in time and judge all of history. We are, you know, we've, I mean, it just, but that, that's how they get a lot of people into these uh, situations where they can't defend themselves because they're making these moral arguments, uh, you know, from from this uh, illogical these illogical positions and people just don't have the way to defend them so we have to just reject their attempts at doing that by again knowing you know their angles and knowing their and a lot of them they're, they're not very creative they're not very uh, they just cut and paste they'll find you know the Islamophobe of, of the time and then just parrot what they're saying so they're not really looking into things they're not understanding things it's just a very surface level uh, you know cursory understanding of anything but they just try to make Muslims and especially Muslim women or anything related to Muslim women appear as though they're deficient and 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 so just don't fall for their games reject those notions and if they're genuine in their inquiry like they really want to know you'll know that but if they're just asking these questions to try to you know do gotcha then you're gonna fall into um, you know unnecessary debate and that I think is where a lot of youth anyway I've seen start to feel insecure because it's like they don't know how to defend their positions, but you have to see their agenda, that they're trying to corner you, um, but they themselves have zero real context. It's, it's ignorance, and they're just, again, parroting maybe what they read somewhere else. So to be also aware of, you know, if you're in, an, if you're, um, in college or even in high school now, all of these things are trickling down at a very, you know, even, I, I would say, middle school likely um, level where these ideas are being introduced in the way that we're studying religion religion as well as uh, just ideas around women and feminism and all of these things but we have to be careful not to fall into their narrative you know I mean we mentioned the binary but there's other ideas as well that just don't debate these people know what their agenda is and be very confident in your own understanding of your faith and then the best way to do that is really to, as mashallah, Imam Ahmed said, you know, is freedom, like, they sell this idea of freedom, 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 and they're even arrogant enough to look to the Muslim world when we have a plethora of our own social ills and problems and plenty of women here who are suffering from all of the disparities of this free society, but yet they have the audacity to look at the Muslim world and start to, you know, judge uh, this country or that country's policies, and it's just... We just have to reject the hypocrisy and the double standards. And the best way to do that, again, is look at the facts, right? Um, am I not moving the slideshow at all? I'm not. Um, thank you. I've totally lost it on this. I don't even know why I'm holding it. A lot to care about. So, you know, in the United States, for example, here are some facts, again, for you to know. More women than men live in poverty. So where's all this freedom getting us, right? As Imam Muhammad said. Um, poverty rates for women and men are nearly even throughout childhood, but then the gap widens significantly for women for, from ages 18 to 44. And this is the demographic or that age where there's really this big push, right? Be the independent woman. Just leave everything. Go do your own thing. Well, where is it leading? You know, the years where you should be looking, inshallah, to building a life with someone, right? Having children, building something that's going to pay it forward for you when you get into those older years. Women you know, are not taught that. They're taught to abandon that and just pursue their own um, careers or whatever it is on this high of, of freedom, but then they end up suffering in this way, subhanAllah. And between the ages of 25 and 34, women are 69% more likely than uh, men of the same age to live in poverty. I mean, that's just tragic, you know. Women make up 47% of the U.S. labor force, um, up from 30% in 1950, but growth has stagnated. So, okay, we've, again, been decades hearing this message of freedom, but there's only a 17% differential from now in 1950. I mean, that should kind of, you know, cause us all to second uh, question this idea that freedom is, is everything. Freedom.
Women's median hourly earnings were $16 in 2016, up from $12.48 in 1980. Right? And then men earned a median, median hourly wage of 1923 in 2016, down slightly from 1940. Let's just look at the difference there. So we, we have clearly not um, you know, been, been so uh, successful, uh, and something's you know, amiss here. Uh, women working are much more likely than working men to say that they face gender discrimination on the job. So you give up your family, you give up all of these other things that are actually going to pay, you know, uh, or really benefit you in the long run. But then you go and you just end up, you know, serving people who humiliate you, who harass you. Like the, it's just there's really the trade-off just doesn't seem right, right? But these are the ideas that so many of our young women are sold to push against tradition, to push against religion and to push against culture, but the proof is in the pudding, as they say, look at this, and you have to examine, well, you know, these are, this is the, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm going to give all, all of that for, is it really worth it? Much more, but um, I think the, the bottom line is, that before we have to break, I'm not sure where I am on time, oh, almost, okay, I'll quickly go through this. This is the real message here, this is what I wanted to leave you with. There, is, there are two lenses, right? I'm wearing glasses right now. We all know what a lens is, but you can either choose to look at your life, the meaning and purpose of your existence through a material lens, which is what this society and what modernity really wants us to see, that there's no greater objective, there's no meta-narrative, there's no grand truth, we're all just going to die and that's it. That's the worldview that they have because they are secular atheists, many of them, they don't have a concept of, of any you know, overarching truth. So when you have a very limited worldview, then you're up, this is what will likely happen. You'll be exploited, as so many women are now, right? They're exploited, they're limited, they're manipulated, they're misunderstood, gaslighted, suppressed. They are treated as being inferior. This is the promise of these open societies. This is what the results are. This is the outcome of, of ascribing to that worldview. Or you can look to your faith and the metaphysical lens, the lens that you want to look through your life with, what, what meaning you have, why Allah SWT created you. It gives you what? What is the promise? The promise of our deen is that you will be empowered, you will be uplifted, you'll be encouraged, you'll be determined, you'll be powerful, pure, and advantaged. And if you do everything for the sake of Allah SWT, this is the promise that you will that you will have, right? Or that you will receive. So at the end of the day, what is, I mean, is there even a debate here, right? Is there even a debate? It should be pretty obvious which one is the better worldview or the way that we should see ourselves through. And inshallah, I really, I, we, have, uh, we have to break for Aisha, but um, the last, you know, bit here, and I'm, I can leave the slides up while we're praying, are just some women that you should know throughout history to, again, affirm your confidence in your faith because we are under attack. There is, um, you know, and it's not just to Muslim women, it's really women of, 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 of all traditions. We're, we're being forced out of things that are very natural for us, femininity, you know, just wanting to be home. I've seen so many posts of, of women who tried to go a certain route, but then realized at a certain point, like, I actually just really want to be home and raise children and have a loving husband and have my family around me. And there's nothing wrong with being a homemaker. And there's nothing wrong with working. There's no issue here. It, everybody's different. But the message is that no, reject everything that I, you know, the traditional part and just go the other way, the way where it's all career driven. And it's all, like you said, individual selfish desire and no you know, responsibility to the community, no responsibility to family. Just reject, no, you don't need to do that. Just do what you, you do you. That's not, our, that's not our faith. And here are women who were able to do it all. They, in many cases, they had incredible legacies. Uh, we mentioned uh, Khadija radiallahu anha, but many others who were first and foremost servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was their primary identity. They didn't look to other labels to affirm themselves. They were servants of Allah and then there were, in many cases, wives, they were mothers, they were daughters, they were sisters, and they embraced all of those roles and knew that these were valuable roles, not because they were looking to other people to dictate to them, but because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them, and they believe in God, and that is who they turn to for meaning and purpose. So these examples are, you know, I mean, there are so many of them, but be familiar with them, feel free to take pictures, and then we'll stop, inshallah, for Aisha, and we'll come back and hear more from Imam Ahmed. Jazakum Allah khairan. You guys after Aisha.
Um, so I was asked by Sheikh Osai to address the first questions. Um, this is a really good one. I heard the word priorities on the woman's side, but not when talking about a man. Was that intentional? Absolutely not. It wasn't intentional. Um, in fact, I, 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 um, uh, there's, there's just too much to really address um, that is impossible to address in one, one lecture. One of those, I mean, that's a lecture in and of itself. What is, what are the priorities for a man uh, uh, in, in the household? And um, generally speaking, one myth that we need to totally um, shatter is the idea that a man doesn't have to be present with his children, that that's what it means to be a Muslim man. And by the way, it's purported by the Red Pill Movement now, too, which many Muslims are, are a part of. Uh, and I, I, forgive me, like I take the opinion that I, I, I'm more sensitive as to why men and women are following these movements. Uh, uh, just like Sheikh Osai, we're both sensitive to the fact as to why it happens. And so when we talk about these mo movements that uh, may not have been grounded originally in our faith, unfavorably, we, when we speak about them unfavorably, I don't want anyone here, and this is actually what I wanted to say. I don't want anyone here to think that we're not sensitive to why people find them compelling. Uh, it's absolutely not true. I found a lot of these ideas compelling for many years of my life. And it's taken me, I'm still on the journey, right? I had to be introduced to people that no one's ever heard of and to read books upon books and have teachers like, for example, Dr. Ali, who's, who's sitting with us, that knows how to navigate these things until I could say comfortably, ah, okay, alhamdulillah for Islam, completely. Um, and and that is the, that's what Imam al-Ghazali says. I think it's one of the most beautiful things that he talks about when, in, in, in regards to knowledge, is he, he makes it clear, and, and our scholars agree, um, that not everyone's going to reach this like confident certainty in all of their values as a Muslim like that. And certainly not going to happen by us just telling you, be confident. <laughs> I mean, like, you got to be confident. That's not, that's not how it works. Many of us are at different journeys, and we're going to have different types of different types of hesitations about certain things and levels of certainty. So then what he says, which I think is very important to remind ourselves of, is that there's a baseline of knowledge that everyone needs to have about Islam. We don't have the time to go into that. I assume many of you know what that is, right? How to pray, five pillars, who's Allah, all these things. Beyond the baseline, he says that Beyond that, what becomes an obligation is whatever is necessary to alleviate these doubts and hesitations that one may have. Okay, so again, I, I want to say this because um, I'll be I'll be the first one to tell you I'm very very unhappy with how we as a community at a very a national level talk about these things, where we start shaming people. Oh, Muslim woman. Becoming a feminist, how dare, and it's just like, do you understand why they find this compelling? Similarly with men, how, how despicable men are listening to Jordan Peterson, subhanAllah, if only they knew. And it's like, okay, if only they knew, why are you telling them, right? Instead of shaming them for, for finding a public intellectual uh, compelling in the absolute absence of Muslim public intellectuals, no, then go tell, go teach, go teach. So. I say that emphatically to say, yes, we have serious critiques of these movements and these people and individuals. But that doesn't mean we're not sensitive to, to, to why they feel compelling to many, especially in a time of, of, of profound religious illiteracy, much of it being the, the, the fault of me, like it falls on us. Like we need to provide avenues for people to, to become confident about their faith through knowledge. So, this question of priorities, again, generally speaking, this myth that we need to completely uh, uh, shatter is that a woman in the home, Islamically speaking, a woman is the one who raises the children, right? And uh, 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 takes care of the children. And then a man is allowed to just go work and come back and be utterly absent from their the lives of their children emotionally completely unavailable and then usually the counter when, when you when you say that's wrong the counter argument is like look men have their roles women have their roles 
which I find, this is my perspective. Again, I, 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 would, I would really love for you to touch on this yourself, uh, Sayida, but this is my perspective. I find that very ironic because there are a lot of men who are very comfortable saying, right? Like, we have a greater degree of responsibility. Okay, so if you have a greater degree of responsibility over women, what happened to that greater degree of responsibility when it comes inside the home? When it, when it comes to actually being available, and, and I, I can speak about this confidently because my father was like this. Now every arrangement, custom, and specific family arrangements, we have to be sensitive to that, okay? And, and I, I, we shouldn't be so quick to assume, oh, if a man, and I'm sorry, I'm just speaking bluntly, if a man is not available in this particular way that we've learned uh, 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 in, I don't know, a university course or something, automatically this person is not uh, 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 fulfilling his rights as a Muslim man for his wife or his children. We should be very careful about immediately judging a situation. We don't know all the finer details, but generally speaking, look at the Prophet Sallallahu example. It's not a coincidence that there are a hadith, uh, a multitude of them, where the Prophet Sallallahu is described as mending his own clothes, that the Prophet Sallallahu is described as cooking, the Prophet Sallallahu is described as someone who's cleaning. Uh, when was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam absent from his children's uh, lives? I mean, subhanAllah, every single time Fatima radiallahu anha would appear, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would get up and go and kiss her on the forehead. This is, the, this is not the example of, of, of what people assume to be this masculine fatherly figure that just comes, provides, sits like a jabbar, doesn't look at his children, doesn't express any love for his children. One time the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was kissing Hassan al-Hussein and when one of the Bedouins he said, you kiss your grandchildren, you kiss your children, the Prophet وسلم, got upset and he said, what does my religion have to offer someone who Allah has taken mercy out of their heart? My In other words, let me paraphrase this, this deen doesn't have anything to offer you if you have no mercy and compassion for your own children. How can this deen be something that you can benefit from if you lack mercy in your heart? So, we find a far more comprehensive model in the model of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That being said, that being said, okay, um, we don't want to, we don't want to, the pendulum, remember the pendulum, we don't want to go the other way, right? And I, I'm telling you as a counselor and as an imam, I'm just telling you what I hear, I'm not, I'm not making value judgments, I'm just telling you what I hear right now. I hear popular sentiment, it's not working well for our community. They bring these examples of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And they project this almost unrealistic example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam upon every man. And the same doesn't go for, uh, it doesn't go both ways. But that's a recipe for disaster, right? So we shouldn't flip the other way just because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mended clothes, he cooked, doesn't automatically mean that a woman cooking and cleaning for a husband is somehow not something desirable or we shouldn't teach our, our, our woman this and, 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 and we shouldn't uh, um, even encourage it. Well, I've heard these things. We shouldn't, we shouldn't encourage our, our woman to cook or to learn how to cook because the Prophet Sallallahu used to cook. We shouldn't encourage our woman to clean uh, or mend clothes because the Prophet Sallallahu did this. See, this is, this is what happens when what? We swing the other way and that is a result of insecurity. That is not the balance of the sunnah. What is the balance of the sunnah? The greater degree of responsibility is that the man is supposed to be within, again, customary means, whatever that looks like, they have to be present for their wife. They have to fulfill the needs of their wife. They have to fulfill it in, 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 in the same way, in, 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 in much of the same way. They have to be present for their children. And on top of that, they are required to, to be physical protectors and also provide uh, uh, financially for their for their household. I don't know if that was act adequate, but I, I just wanted to um, make it emphatic that you know you'd be surprised much of the priorities that a woman would have in a family are similar to what a man would have in a family. But are there nuanced differences? Absolutely. Okay, and we shouldn't in the effort of trying to respond to very clear. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, abuse maybe, or I don't want to use that word, but like to, to respond to at times an unfairness towards a, a woman, we don't want to swing the, the other way as well because that's not going to be conducive or healthy for our community. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Uh, I should have just said my father, can you answer this? <laughs>
He said no. Uh, would you do you do you, do you want me to answer this? Stuck for the If you can, please don't even give me this back. I just, as you were speaking, Mashallah, I feel you said it really when you mentioned that all we have to do is look to the Prophet and the discussion is over because he settles it. He settles the debate between what is the ideal role of a father, a husband, a man in every regard. And that's why when, um, you know, when we do parenting sessions or when we talk about parenting, often the most common, you know, hadith that is relayed is the hadith that really also equalizes the the objectives of both the male and the female, like you said, right there. They both have common, uh, you know, uh, drives or common objectives, but sometimes because we become so um, polarized in these discussions, everybody's, again, just in their own corners. We're, not, we're forgetting that we're on the same team. So the hadith, ala kulukum ra'in wa kulukum mas'unun an ra'ithi, is my, it's just a brilliant hadith. Right, this is, and I'll give you the English because look at the way that the phrasing, um, you know, the order of the words or the order of the, the roles that he describes. First, he says that everyone, so he's speaking to all of us, right? Mm. Every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his flock. So that's unilaterally across the board, we're all shepherds, right? Then he goes into the distinctions. The leader of people is a guardian and is responsible for his subjects. Mm -hmm. A man is the guardian of his family, and he is responsible for them. You know, pretty clear. A woman is the guardian of her husband's home and his children, and she is responsible for them. The servant of a man is a guardian of the property of his master, and he is responsible for it. No doubt every one of you is a shepherd and is responsible for his flock. This is in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Now, this hadith... Again, when I, you know, when I do leader, uh, sorry, parenting, I talk about the, the universal quality that is described here, shepherding or leadership, right? So if you, both men and women just understand their role as being leaders in the household, then you need to understand, well, what does that mean? You know, because a leader isn't just someone who dictates, right? That's not, or, 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 or delegates, right? That's sometimes how we perceive leadership. It's just the one who is do this, do that. You know, that's not leadership. Leadership is defined by certain qualities. Among them, strong communication, right? So being able to effectively communicate. Passion and commitment. To who? To your subjects, who you're leading. So you're committed to them. That means you're prioritizing them. You're not selfishly absorbed. You're not completely, you know, um, have your priorities, you know, off. You're committed to them. You're positive. Right? So if you're coming home with negative energy or you're in the home and you're just negative, then that's obviously an issue. You're also creative in terms of really wanting to bring, you know, bring um, a, 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 a vitality to your home. That it's, things don't become stagnant and boring and repetitive and mundane. But you're trying to you know, bring that positive energy forward. And then you're also collaborative. So these are the marks of leadership, strong leadership. And then... If you again look, in, and these are all things that are studied, right, that we have these ideas around leadership, but how do, does a leader really effectively lead? First and foremost, you understand yourself well. So that's, you know, the baseline. You need to know yourself well. And if you don't know yourself, you don't know your role that you have, that you, you know, are accountable, right, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you to be accountable to him, and you've lost that, that, that understanding that, you, you know, you will be asked about, all that you did and all that you didn't do, right? The, to have that, um, to, to be clear about that. But then other things as well. Just if you have certain needs that you're able to communicate those needs, right? Because a lot of times our uh, tension in a household is because either people don't know what their needs are because they were never taught that or they don't know how to vocalize those needs. So really having that self-awareness is so important. Um, and, and then to understand those in your care, to understand the needs of those in your care, and, you know, you go into further descriptions, potential dangers and threats, that's where the protective qualities. So both the husband and the wife should protect one another um, and just seek counsel when they need. But these are all the qualities of effective leaders. And I think if we really start with this instead of, you know, I'm the man and I'm the woman and, and it already starts off with this negative, you know, again, power grabbing kind of a, a, a you know, dynamic. If we avoid that and say we're both being tasked with leadership, right? Bringing children into this world is an amana. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has elevated both of us, but he's given us our specific roles. And as long as we understand what those roles are and we hold each other accountable as well, because 
again, we should look out for one another. We're supposed to be in this together. So if I see you slipping in your duties and in your, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the things that you're responsible for, I, out of care for you, I remind you. But what do we end up doing? We don't do that. We let anger take over us. And now it's shame. It's, you know, it's anger. And it just, it's a repeat cycle of, of more, you know, um, negativity. So we just have to, I think, reframe the entire concept of what a marriage is. It's a collaborative, beautiful relationship of two individual leaders, each tasked with their own responsibilities. And if they're complementary and they understand that, they work together to create a cohesive, beautiful family dynamic. But if each of them are competing with those powers, they, they're bringing their cultural understandings or their limited understanding of what men need and what women need, you have no understanding of each other or yourself, then obviously communication breaks down, everybody goes their separate ways and there's tension and the marriage likely is not going to last. That's precisely what Iblis would love more than anything else. So I think the bottom line is know what we're, you know, the, the example again of the Prophet said him that he's the one he, who gave us this brilliant analogy of shepherding and really understand what that means. And if each of us do that, inshallah, our homes, I mean, I know, I know that sounds very simplistic, but I truly believe there's nothing better than just following the advice of the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which of course are the same. So, bismillah. Um, <laughs> no, 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 I, uh, this is actually, uh, I'll answer this question, I'm going to hand off the rest to you. Actually, yeah, you should be maybe reading some of these while I'm answering this one. This is a great question, bismillah. This is, um, I'm very lucky to have grown up at MCC in a community that values uh, the leadership and contributions of women, alhamdulillah. May Allah reward all the amazing women and men, teachers, scholars, leaders, and service providers. Unfortunately, when I went to college, I was shocked that the local mosque does not allow women on the masjid board. They also have reservations about any female scholars coming in to speak to both men and women. I was more shocked to find that this was not surprising to many peers who came who come from hometowns with mosques with similar cultures and policies. Is this Islamically acceptable? Is this not a form of discrimination? Is it justifiable? Why is this a seemingly common policy? Is it on women to prove their value to the community? And if so, how can we do that? Um, first of all, Jazakallah Khairan or Jazak Mulkhan, actually, no, I'm presuming this is a sister um, who wrote that, but thank you for uh, writing that question because, you know, I think some of us have maybe in the course of our lives been part of um, mosques with certain similar uh, ideas and um, it's very the default uh, you know reaction to a situation like that is to become reactive and angered by it because you perceive it as being unfair and unjust but we have to first of all practice what our dean teaches us which is seek to understand why right instead of jumping to conclusions, snap judgments, and you just presume everybody's a misogynist and they hate women and they're trying to leave women out of the fold and they're discriminatory, which is the presumption from the, you know, from the, from just, you know, from what you perceive, seek to understand. And that can only happen with dialogue. So I'm a big advocate of actually trying to reach people through dialogue, through intellectual, you know, exchanges, through requests for meetings, through allyship, seeking out people from that community who may be able to accompany you to request a meeting. Maybe these board members come from a culture or a background that, yes, it's just a little culturally maybe atypical to find women uh, involved in leadership. But does that mean that they're horrible people? Does it mean that they are, you know, they hate women? No, maybe it's just unfamiliar to them and they don't know how to do it. So if we have the proper husn of dhan and we're not armed with all this anger and just presumption, which we should never lead with, and we actually request can we talk, you know, can we see what's going on? Maybe we'll come to a place of understanding that they're, they come from cultures where, again, that's just very, that, that's not something that they're familiar with to even solicit women to come in and help. And they've been gatekeeping because that's all they know. Uh, maybe they have bylaws that they don't even understand that they've, they're restricted by. Uh, who knows, right? But I just feel like I think this culture or this time is just so reactive and so suspicious and that's not our deen. You can go into, right, the seerah and you see that even when people would come to the Prophet ﷺ, like the beautiful exchange between Khalid bin Walid and uh, the Prophet ﷺ, when one of the men came to the Prophet ﷺ, imagine, he's, the Khalid bin Walid is with the Prophet ﷺ and a man comes to him and he says to the Prophet ﷺ himself directly, Ittaqallah, Ya Muhammad, I mean just the concept of someone speaking like that. 
to the Prophet, but he tells him to fear God. So Khalid bin Walid is, of course, so offended for the sake of the Prophet. Said he's ready. He's like, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm ready to take his neck. Like I'm ready to take him right here. Do you permit me to do so? And the Prophet said, No, because maybe he's amongst those who pray. But again, Khalid bin Walid, his ghayrah is so immense for the Prophet he, he's not satisfied maybe with that because he really is angered for his sake. So he says, well, there's a lot of people who say what's on their tongues, not what's in their hearts, right? They may be claiming to be Muslim, but maybe they're not. And the Prophet said, said what? I was not sent to examine the breasts of men, like to, to pres- per, per, you know, presume the intentions of human beings. And this, among many other hadiths, he's teaching us, right? to control our presumptions, our biases, our prejudices, to not have these snap judgments, to actually give people the benefit of the doubt. Maybe again, they come from backgrounds. Like I can tell you, I'm from, you know, a very, uh, I mean, my, my family background, we're, we're from Kandahar, Afghanistan. The, the, the men of my particular, you know, uh, city are known to be very, they're, it's a tribal kind of mindset, but they're very beautiful people. They just have certain strict rules around these things. And I would never presume that because if I went to an immigrant Afghan masjid and that they felt, uh, you know, a little awkward around me, that it was against me. Per- like, I wouldn't personalize that. And I feel like we're in a time where everybody's taught to just personalize everything. But maybe it's not about you. Maybe they, again, have a total different understanding about these things. And culturally, it's very taboo for them, you know, to, to, to have certain, you know, uh, situations. Now... To answer the question, of course, we, we just went through an entire presentation that says no. There is no, uh, nothing in Islam that would say it would be permissible to remove women from the masjid or to not allow them to be participating. They were, they, I mean, that's a clear fact. But I think my point is, is the way that we approach situations like this should be first and foremost to not jump into a negative state and to then um, be in any way uh, or to personalize things and, and then to react to it, but to rather seek to understand and try to work within that community. Maybe there are other leaders that you can contact and say, I notice that there's no women involved in this masjid. Can we maybe have a meeting with these elders or these board members? I would love to come and present a case for maybe including more women, for bringing more programming for women and children. Maybe I can help with that. And if you come from that very you know, pure intention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, tawfiq comes from him, but I really believe the way that we do things has to be informed with the with etiquette, with adab, with good akhlaq, and we can't abandon the principles of our faith in defense of our faith. It just makes no sense to me. You can't just abandon, right, the example of the Prophet Sallallahu because you're so, it doesn't make sense, right? So just follow his way of meeting people where they're at, trying to, you know, be a bridge builder, be a person who um, is extending understanding, but push, advocate. Don't let people silence you. And I'll be the first one to help you if you want, especially if they're from Afghanistan. <laughs> let me know. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah. I want to add one, uh, well, not really add, just reaffirm one thing. Um, on this question of masjids and women in masjid, because I'm very sensitive to it, as you know, in my, this is like my field. Um, I want us to go back to the principle we learned today and just remember, and hopefully this will help you be um, more wise and empathic in engaging this discussion, is that um, a valid custom, a valid custom, is that women simply don't go to the masjid. And that is a valid, not just a custom, that's a, that's a valid legal position in Islamic law. Um, and, and I'm going to teach you something today. So you, oh, subhanAllah, men in their fiqh, right? Like, well, you'd be surprised. Uh, the school of law that takes this position, that women are not encouraged to go to the masjid, do you know where they take it from? They take it from a saying of Aisha, radiallahu anha. They take it from a hadith of Aisha, radiallahu anha which they interpret as general, where she said, you know, uh, the paraphrasing of is, uh, women shouldn't go to the masjid. Right? You women shouldn't go to the masjid. One school of law takes that as a general rule. Other schools of law don't. They say, no, this is a specific contextual situation. And even if it was the general rule, right, these things depend again on, you know, the application the art of true fatwa 
and, and, and uh, Islamic application is what we call تنزيل الأحكام إلى الواقع is to bring down some of these rulings to the present realities which is why I have no qualms in saying I say this publicly, I've said it a billion times is that uh, uh, in our context in America this is not an acceptable position by acceptable meaning it is not a wise position to, to hold at all in our spaces because our masajid are for, for to a large extent the place not a place there's no ancillary structures I went to Turkey so I always wondered I was surprised by this right this development because you know the, the fiqh there uh, uh, takes that position for the most part they still had uh, spaces for women in the masajid but that, that was surprising to me and then you know you do this work long enough and you speak to enough people and you're like oh subhanAllah many women actually are comfortable with this they, they they're actually prefer this type of uh, setup and situation. In fact, believe it or not, when I was at, uh, when I was working, <laughs> once upon a time, uh, I was trying to, in a particular place, uh, advocate for uh, um, a space in the main hall of the masjid for women in the back. Because where they were upstairs was just like, I mean, I was uncomfortable. I was just like, I don't want my mom to be there. It was just, it was just weird. Uh, it was like you couldn't see anything at all and it was very tiny and and so I advocated for this um, Do you know who were the ones that were most staunchly against this? Women Muslim women in that community and I'm not saying uh, uh, and, and, and I know I, I don't want the impulse to be ah look women being other women's you know uh, uh, enemies or <laughs> you know the greatest object. No, what I'm trying to say is that uh, is that we determine priorities based on our reality and, and the true fuqaha, the, 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 the real jurists, the people that understand our context will all, I mean, many of them will tell you that of course women have to have a place in the masjid and that should be encouraged and we should be emphatic about encouraging because that is our reality here but in having this conversation I just want you to be sensitive that, that the things that exist that may rub us off like rub us a different way and make us uncomfortable we shouldn't be and this is the training of the postmodern mind immediately we jump to chauvinism 100% there you go men in their fiqh it's like and this is whenever I tell people that this is a that they base this off an opinion of Aisha people are shocked because who are you gonna what are you gonna say to Aisha <laughs> who is Aisha one of the most public women Right, the, the, the one that had the confidence to correct other male companions in their understanding of Islam. So we shouldn't be so quick to assume some of these things and be sensitive to, to, to the various contexts and recognize that, here's another controversial thing, this idea of like, we're all going to be unified in America, it is a, I would even argue is a dangerous idea. In that, what do you mean by unity? You, 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 really, you really think in the most, the most unprecedentedly diverse context in Islamic history, do you understand? Never in Islamic history has there been more of diverse context than the context of American Islam or Islam in America. You expect in that context, everyone is just going to worship the same way? Everyone's spaces are going to operate in the same way? It's just not going to happen. And, and I think we shoot ourselves in the foot, as they say, which is a really bad analysis. <laughs> you stop saying that. But like we, we, we work against ourselves when we try to call for something that may be unrealistic. We set ourselves up uh, for disappointment. That being said, again, just so people don't misinterpret, I have no qualms saying publicly that I believe it is not at all the opinion that we should follow in America and that every single masjid in America should be a space where women are welcomed, honored, and, and not just welcomed, but honored. That means they don't come in and they find some closet space, right, with 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 a with an ugly, dirty curtain that they're st you know praying behind. This is this is this would not be the ascent of the Prophet Sallallahu because it didn't exist in his masjid. This is these were not the realities of the Prophet Sallallahu masjid. So how dare us say, you know, we're going to contradict some fundamentals because of custom? That's not how that works, right? Um, okay, the, the other question that we got. I'm just going to read it and just tell you I can't answer it. <laughs> but I, I want to be on. I want to. I want to let you know that I, I saw the question. Is that our hijab mandates and enforcing hijab as a policy um, Islamically permissible for a government to establish? Like, is it Islamically legal? I have a view on this. 
but, and I have some reading on this, but I'm not an expert in this field. And it would be very irresponsible for me to answer something I'm not an expert about. Um, if you, as a friend, want to come up to me and be like, what's your view? No problem. I'll share with you my view as a friend. But uh, as a teacher now, as an imam, I don't feel comfortable answering this question. Forgive me. And I don't have the requisite expertise. All right, and say that, you know, our, our teacher also uh, agrees. Um, what can we do? How can we support women that are stripped away from their rights, from ignorant Muslim men that follow culture over what Islam uh, preaches? Okay. Um, first of all, I want us to get out of our minds, and it's hard. This is a sensitive one. It's hard to do this. But I want us to get out of our minds this idea that culture is this thing that is bad, and Islam, whatever that means, is this thing that is good. And they're always like uh, 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 in, in opposition. Right? This has never been the idea of our history. In fact, culture is the very means by which Islam is preserved. That the whole point of culture, right, especially in Islamic ethos, is to help preserve Islam. Right? Now, at times there are cultural norms and customs that contradict Islam. Those norms and customs should be rejected and opposed, and we should speak publicly against them. And maybe this, this may not be the most satisfactory answer, inshallah, I'm sure you do a better job, Sheikha. But I, I will say that, um, that really we just need to, we just, we just need to raise, raise men. I mean, the, this stuff happens in the home. Again, cliche, this has been heard before, I get it, it may not be the most satisfactory, but I, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, that uh, uh, we, we, so many, almost all, almost all of the complaints that I've gotten as an imam my whole life from parents about their children, my parent, my children don't pray. Okay, do you pray at home? No, we don't pray at home. Uh, my children, you know, uh, uh, don't believe, you know, in this and that. Question is, okay, well, did you facilitate opportunities? for good company, for the opportunities for knowledge? Did you, you know, devote time to doing your best to answer their questions, entertain their questions, facilitate resources? So if we, if we don't do this, if we don't do this, I promise you no amount of lectures that we're doing here is going to do anything. It, it's just not. It, it, it can catalyze. It can be sparks. This is, this is helpful. This is important. It's like a healing circle for me. This is what I see public formats like this as. It's just an opportunity for us to uh, 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 reflect upon some of the things that are necessary for our own healing. And inshallah, maybe learn a, a tool here and there. But really, the work, the real work, isn't done by people like me. It's done by the parents in the homes. And those parents need to be supported. Recently, Sheikh Jamal Diwan actually posted this uh, great book. Uh, I'm not a parent, but I'm fascinated with this stuff. Um, it's, it's called Parenting Inside Out. Have you, have you ever heard of it? So basically what they found in all of these recent studies about, uh, you, you've heard it? Okay, mashallah. Uh, so I guess very quickly is the idea of like um, the, the, the most, the, the healthiest children, okay, are those who had parents who worked through their own childhood and adolescent experiences, processed them properly, and was able to parent properly in the home as a result, right? But when parents aren't, uh, uh, you know, themselves, they're not taking their own health seriously, and then when we don't support the, the parents themselves in this enterprise, then of course it's, it's, it's going to be a huge, huge, huge challenge. Um, so that's what I believe is the ultimate solution. And I, I, of course, it, it goes without saying that when there are they're, they're quote-unquote toxic developments that, that contradict our, the foundations of our, of our deen, then that falls on the leadership to be very, very public and vocal about these things. And so, look, I don't want to talk about politics, but I personally am appalled at how many people are apologetic about women shouldn't be educated. I'm appalled by this. And... You know, that's, the, that's, that's my realm. My realm is I can do my best to publicly be, be open as, as much as I can, to be vocal as much as I can, be like, no, this is right for women. Uh, 
you know, uh, this is something that, that the men are doing that is wrong, and we should speak out against it, and we should try to find solutions. But ultimately, that long-term generational work that we're talking about can only happen when we support parents to do their job in the best way possible. Lastly, and then I'm done, alhamdulillah. Uh, not alhamdulillah, I'd love to ask, say more judges, but, you know, you know like, uh, I, I, I much prefer Sheikh Hassan answer all of these. I just wanted to, about the priorities question, I actually wanted to address something. Um, I, I'm going to tell you from experience um, what these questions, by the way, about like priorities and you heard like rights and duties of men and women and responsibilities. I had one of my shiuch, he um, in fifth class once, he told us, he told us, the moment you start talking about rights and responsibilities, your marriage is in big trouble. And what does he mean by that? Meaning, Fip is just the basic, bare bone, like, uh, 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 basic, bare bone, uh, um, uh, uh, what's the word, like mitigators of, uh, 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 of, of a relationship. It, it's not like, you don't go to f these fiqhi kind of conceptions or, 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 they're just boundaries. Like, when you get to a state, no, when it's really bad, by the way, this man at the core, this is what he's responsible for, a woman at the core, like, that's when you default to this. And so, what I have found is that usually these become a problem when they're not discussed before marriage. You cannot expect, especially from men, that they're all going to just accept a pure egalitarian you know, uh, 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 marriage, right? Especially when most of them don't even know what that means, right? It's like, you, you, you and, and vice versa, right? Especially in a time where all our cultural norms are shifting and changing. You can't expect from, from, from women to have this neat, tight, you know, packed list of all the things she's required to do and the man has all the things he's required to do and they all know it and they've memorized it such that they don't need to discuss it before marriage. I promise you, every single situation that becomes a problem later is usually not discussed before marriage, or when it comes up, it's not, as they say, nipped in the bud. It's not given adequate care before it becomes, and even it, it brings out all of these other problems. So my greatest recommendation, you've heard about premarital counseling and these things, but like, my greatest recommendation is that don't expect, especially in our time, do not expect a spouse to read your mind. Don't do that. It's, 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 I'm telling you it's a recipe for disaster. What you should do, if, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, inshallah you'll, 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 you'll be giving far better answers, but what I really recommend is men and women before they get married, they need to be as open in their communication as possible. You need to ask, what is your conception of a, a, a husband? What is that? What is that? What is your role? What is our role going to be? Uh, and, and, you know, to asking it generally is not as always as helpful. So ask specifically, like, here's how I feel about this. And what do you feel about this? When these things are discussed in advance, it doesn't open, uh, open room for, for problems later. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Say that. Do you have anything to add? Of course. I, mean, I shouldn't even ask you what do you mean. I want you to add. Yes. Jazakallah khairan. Again, we could just listen to you all day, right? Am I, am I right? MashaAllah, he's amazing. MashaAllah, Allah bless you. Um, this question, I'm, again, presuming it's coming from a sister, and I've done these programs so often that it's a very um, common sentiment. A lot of women feel powerless because, you know, they're, they don't have sometimes maybe the, the support of within the home or within their family systems or maybe even the community to advocate for their rights. And so they feel like, what can I do? You know, I don't, you know, I, I don't have rights that I'm owed and there's a cultural imperative here. So how can we work around it? And I do think we, for the sister who asked um, just to address her specifically, I would say it's very important, again, going back to kind of what I was saying earlier, to um, approach these problems, not from a triggered emotional state, but from a really intellectual state where you are trying to solve the problem, you know, strategically. Because emotions get us in trouble, right? I've seen this pan out terribly because we become so 
overwhelmed by maybe the injustices or whatever is going on in the right. home, that it just can spiral into a really negative place that there's no solutions uh, and there, and whatsoever, and it just ends up really terrible. But if you just stop and humanize your husband, for example, if this is a very personal question to the sister who asked, if your husband came from a culture where maybe he has the, a flawed understanding of men and women, and he has, uh, there's just a lot of cultural baggage and, and uh, ignorance trauma. there, and trauma maybe, and maybe it wasn't modeled for him, the first step is just first and foremost humanize him. He is a product of dysfunction. He's a product of a negative uh, environment. It, this isn't like he just decided to be, you know, ignorant or to be maybe oppressive or whatever. Usually these are cyclical, right? So when we understand that, that creates empathy. And from empathy, we then go to what we're taught in our deen, right? Adina nasiha. This is your spouse. And, you know, for good and for better or for worse, right? All the the vows that, that we hear uh, in, in this culture anyway. But that's how we should look at it. Like, this is the person Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought as my partner. We may have children together. And just because things aren't going well and I feel that there's injustices and imbalances of the relationship, the easy route is just say, I'm done and I'm going to leave this person to himself. He's an oppressor. And just fill yourself with all this anger and animus towards him. And then he's still going to be the parent, father of your children. You're likely never going to be rid of him, right? What good does that do you? Whereas if you take a different approach and say, okay, so he's not giving me my rights, maybe because he himself is, like you said, there's trauma, there's a lot of context there. Maybe I can seek to find that context either by myself or try to somehow strategically explore what's going on with him. Of course, first line is to call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A lot of people have these circumstances, whether it's with their marriages or their children or their lives, but they don't do the, the necessary work to call on the only one who could change your circumstance. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people, if it's really this bad and you're really feeling oppressed and you're really feeling constricted, are you waking up, you know, for tahajjud? Are you pleading with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are you, you know, really calling on the one who's going to change your circumstance? If you're not doing that, but you're just sitting with anger and resentment and letting all of that fester in this toxic pool of emotions that will do you no good, right. then you are letting shaitan base you're doing the bidding of shaitan you have to raise i mean you have to approach this from the position of aqal either a marriage is meant to uh, thrive or not right or i mean meant to survive or not if it's a, if it's in this um if it's not you know i mean if there are problems so uh, you can either approach it like inshallah i, I want to help this uh, marriage um you know out of its problems so what can i do and that's where you seek counsel, right? We talked about the qualities of a good leader is that they know when they've reached a point where they can't do anymore. So mm -hmm. if you've been trying, you've right. appealed this, your husband, he's not listening to you, then you have to seek counsel to experts, to people who can maybe give you a, pl a roadmap or a plan of action or something um, and seek that advice because on your own, you haven't been effective. And that's not a slight or a deficiency. It may be just he's not hearing you. Or again, maybe there's just too many barriers that he has to, you know, that we have to work through, but another person could potentially reach them. So I would say try to find help for yourself to fortify yourself to get to that place where you're ready to do this difficult work. Don't just discard him as this ignorant Muslim with cultural problems. Please, he's a human being. He may have a context that you need to sympathize and empathize with, and maybe you will be a means for his guidance. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring, because you're sincere, your heart is so sincere, that you will be the reason why he breaks free from the chains of, naf, uh, of nafs and shaitan and all those things that are compelling him towards uh, what he's doing, maybe you'll be the reason why he's able to do that. And because he's your partner in life, you should be invested to try at least, to try. So reach out to someone or multiple people who can help you. Try to come up with a strategy. But don't just, I feel like this idea that I feel is very, comes from this modern lens of looking at the world, which is just discard anybody who's not, you know, serving you. You know, you can just throw people away. And it's such a dangerous and really terrible way to live, you know? And I think it's really taken hold of a lot of our um, people, unfortunately. And that's why divorce, there used to be a differential between this, the, you know, American uh, rate of divorce and the Muslim, you know, rate. Now there's no difference. We're just leaving relationships left and right because ah, I'm done. 
I'm inconvenienced, I don't like him, he's this, he's that, she's this, she's that. So people just throw people away, but that's not the spirit of our faith. Um, and ultimately, we're accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You try your best, but I feel like when I look at the Prophet Sallallahu and I see how he gave everybody a chance, you know, and he tried to reach people, that's our example. And if you're not even trying that, um, that's a problem. But I think for this specific sister, I would just say again, you know, do your spiritual work, call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. Second, look to experts, uh, ask either, look for therapists for yourself, see if there's a path for maybe some, you know, marital counseling between you two. If not, then look to maybe within the family, because there might be people in your family, maybe siblings um, or other people who can help you advocate for your rights. But do it, please, with the right niya, with which is not, you know, I want to shame and I want to just, you know, take him to task and um, get my justice. But rather, I want him to break free from this ignorance and free us and our family from these oppressive cycles and grow together, inshallah. And when you have niya like that, I feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, will give you tawfiq. So may Allah make it easy. Sorry for the long answer. Jazakallah <laughs> khair. Forgive me for the long answer. But I feel like this question is also a very deep, heavy one. Mashallah, the sister wrote the other question too. I can tell by the handwriting. You've got a lot of great, um, and they're very, very deep questions, but there's just so many layers to answering these types of questions. They have to do with cultural, you know, context. Uh, and I, I don't know the cultural context to this issue, so I don't, I don't feel qualified also to speak about all these things. But um, do we, oh, we do have another question. question yeah, Bismillah. Okay, so here you can take the. Inshallah. And well, we, after, if you want to come off, Inshallah, we'll answer the question. Um, okay, so I'll just quickly, because I have the mic for convenience sake, answer this one, and then we'd love to hear you and your final thoughts, Imam Ahmed. The question is, how do I explain to teenage girls that boys get some privileges that girls may not get without diving into feminism arguments, like staying out a bit late, visiting places with other girls, Okay, I'm a little confused by that and last part, but um, I think the question honestly like mixed, is mixed gender. yeah. Oh, I see. Thank you, Jazakallah khair. That makes sense. Okay, yeah. I um, I think the question is a bit problematic because I do feel that these double standards are issues, and we should raise our children, you know, uh, to have there should be one standard in terms of you know what we allow for them to do sons and daughters should both be expected to, you know, like I said, do the chores in the home, come home at a certain time, but to prefer or to give one gender more access, more ability to move and do things and not the other doesn't resonate in this day and age. It will cause problems in your home because it reeks of prejudice. It reeks of prefer preferential treatment. It reeks of, you know, all the things that we are, that, and then it just gives them more doubt in Islam because it's like, well, that's just an unfair system. And when they're being bombarded with the message of equity and everything has to be perfect and balanced, and then they're living a reality where they're literally seeing double standards right unfold before them, it will cause them faith crises. Why do that? What is the problem with saying all of my children, I don't care what your you know, gender is or whatever it is, this is the rule of our house. You do this, you have responsibilities, and you have to be home at a certain time. And no, we don't allow free mixing or whatever. But I, I just feel like this, um, the, 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 the way that the question's set up, I think, honestly causes a lot of problems. And this is, you know, my lived experience. It caused issues in our household, you know, growing up because I saw it. I thought it was just really weird, you know, why. There, it didn't make sense to me. Um, and, but alhamdulillah, when you learn Islam, you realize these are a lot of these things are cultural. They're not obviously religious. So I feel like we shouldn't perpetuate cultural ideas that actually cause problems for people in their faith. And that's what this type of, you know, just, you know, creating unfair systems do. So, but I'd like, love to hear more from you. No. no, this is my, that's the end of me. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done too. No, no, we need to hear from you. And then final thoughts, please. Uh, what I what I agree with mostly is that Sheikh Hosai's presentation was amazing. <laughs> so I 100% agree with you on that. And uh, yeah, I think uh, you know those were what you said. Uh, th this is this is a th this is a topic that it's its own topic. 
derivatives. And um, I will say that mawadda and rahma, if we want to talk about mawadda and rahma, I think there's a huge difference between Muslims explaining here's what we believe and uh, 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 you know abrasively, abrasively, uh, uh, you know, uh, speaking about what they believe in a way that dehumanizes people because that's not mawadda wa rahma. Mawadda wa rahma, and and this is my this is what I offer to this discussion, is that this is a long discussion. I don't think much of what you said anyone would disagree with, um, but we I don't I don't see the kindness the mawadda of rahma that facilitates a conversation with others about this in a way that's actually constructive, and I think we have to reject these identity politics and structure our entire Islam around these identity politics, right? That one you know this this the, you know. That our, our entire our entire Muslim identity is structured around these these political uh, uh, many times political fights that are happening uh, in our land. So I would just say that yes, this is a huge conversation. Um, we addressed it a little bit. I addressed it a little bit when, when we talked about gender and and uh, we also said that there's, there's exceptions. That's all over our fiqh. Those exceptions exist, and our fuqaha always honored those exceptions. Um, and, and that is what I would like for us to really reflect on, is that at the, at the end of the day, it's our responsibility to take our truth and to make tabliq, صح? We should, we should be comfortable and confident enough to tell people, here's what I believe as a Muslim. I'll tell you what will fail if we say, here's what I believe as a Muslim in a way that totally bulldozes real emotions that people feel. People are struggling. People are confused, right? So, so many of our Muslim kids may not be. I'll tell you as an imam, they're just as confused. And if I come and say, you know, why are we even having this conversation? And I'm glad you brought this up because, no, it's a conversation to have. Some people are like, what a silly, how can we even talk about this? What you just did is you just told a bunch of people that may have been sincere in their search, don't open this up. We're not here to discuss this. Your emotions mean nothing. They're invalid. I don't believe this is. I'm not, you didn't say this. You didn't say this. This is why I said. This is what I'm adding. I, I, I don't believe this to be the sunnah of the Prophet The Prophet dealt with the most immoral and most decrepit of people in society. People were making tawaf around the Kaaba naked, okay, and he dealt with these people with kindness, and gentleness. Of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said that. Musa salam was commanded to go to Pharaoh with gentleness. How should we go to the people around us who are very justifiably confused because of the unprecedented amount of conflicting and opposing ideas that everyone purports as their as the way of life? This is the, this is this is the truth. This is the truth. This is the truth. People are confused. So we should we should just be sensitive to that. Barakalafiko. Do we have any questions online before we conclude? Say did you like to say anything before we conclude? All right, inshallah with that, barakallahu uh, feekum. This was a much needed conversation. It, it, trust me, it's healing just as much for us as it is for you. I hope it was healing for you in some, in some regards. Uh, uh, you, you know, I hope we can continue having these. And I would love for Masajid to start having these discussion groups where, where people are just open. Just like, here's what I think a man should be in a relationship. Here's what I think a woman should be in a relationship. And, and those conversations hopefully are facilitated by people who have some, you know, like our, our dear teacher, have some training in the deen that can help at least have a space where we, feel, where we feel like we have the license to think critically. And there's nothing wrong with that. What we don't and we shouldn't do is arrogantly undermine our own faith in the name of these weird ideas that we claim from freedom to justice, the whole nine yards. No, we should have some intellectual humility and say, at the end of the day, I'm Muslim, I'm struggling, I don't understand these things. I'll go to this measure discussion group, I'll express these feelings, and we should have you know, spaces where those feelings are honored, those discussions are had. So inshallah, we can figure out some of these things that are just unprecedented, we haven't figured out before. So, barakallah uh, fikum. Can we conclude with a dua?
Allah, we ask you from your mercy to fill our hearts with mercy that we show to everyone around us. Oh Allah, we ask you to allow the mercy to be our beauty mark in the way that we treat one another. We ask you, O oh Allah, for those of us who are confused, put the avenues in our path to clear that confusion. You are Al-Alim. You are the most knowledgeable. Allow us to, to, to learn and know the truth of matters. Your Prophet used to say, Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa wa zuqna tiba'a wa arina al-baatila baatila wa zuqna shibnaba. Your Prophet instructed us to pray that we ask you, O Allah, to show us truth as it is and help us follow it. And we ask you to help us see falsehood as it is and help us stay away from it. We ask you, O Allah, to give us a, a certainty in faith that makes the trials of life easy. We ask you to give healing to all those struggling here. We ask you, Ya Allah, by, by their coming here to make this a means of their entrance into Jannah, a means of their healing from their pain, a means of relieving their anguish. We ask you, O Allah, to reunite all of us in paradise, where we look back at these moments with a smile and with gratitude that we came for your sake, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And allow us, Ya Allah, fill our hearts with love that it overflows to those around us and give us righteous company that keep us upon the example of your greatest of creation, Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasifoon. Wa Salaamu Ala Mursaleen. Wa Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Your homework? You have homework. Spoken like a true. No. Sorry, bro. Sorry, bro. You have homework on winter break, right? This will make sure it never comes back. No, I just, yeah. Your homework is before you leave to make a small dua for the organizers like Brother Munir. Make a small dua for the masjid. Make a small dua for our teacher here and, and her family. And, 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 and a dua for yourself because the angels are present with us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we were taught by the Prophet sallallahu that in a gathering like this where the angels are all surrounding us, this is one of the highest moments of istijaba of of, of, of qabul and acceptance of our du'as. So inshallah, take a minute before you go, just make a du'a for this beautiful masjid that Allah preserves it and protects it and, and protects the organizers and then make a du'a for our teachers and, and for yourself. Barakallahu feekum wa salam For those joining us online, thank you for joining us online. Inshallah. We see you, proverbially.